Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let's begin this morning drawing on the insights of our first resource person. He is the practice lead, managed security services and consulting MEA, intelligent security dimension data. This morning, he walks us through C-level engagement in building organizational cyber resilience in the COVID-19 era. Please make welcome Dr. Bright C. Maudo. Everyone, how are you all today? It's, it's, it's such an honor to be the first person to even start presenting this conference. What we are all facing right now, we are in the world of digital transformation and some of the things that we don't expect to see or happen are actually happening to us. I'm gonna take you through, how many of you have ever been hacked before? Anyone? Or your organization? No one? Your wife, good. So that means all the others are victims today. So if I pick you randomly, please don't be, don't be shy to raise your, your hand. Because we're actually gonna hack you today when you're watching. Is that okay? Hello? <laughs> yeah, we have to, because that's the only way you get to see things. So we're looking at C-level engagement in building organizational resilience um, during COVID-19 era. So many hacking have happened. Recently we saw how the US um, pipeline, well, all pipelines have been hacked in their ways. Usually the board or senior management usually does not like to get involved in, in things to do with cybersecurity and the likes until this happens. As security breaches happen, we're looking at reputational damage being on the line. We are seeing the financial um, loss has been triggered and sometimes a total lockdown of a network. As we can see, one of the biggest things that we're finding right now is ransomware. If you're aware of ransomware, it's where your machine gets locked and you have to pay in bitcoins for you to be able to get access to your computer. Now, cyber criminals are taking advantage of ways to be able to take over your systems because of that. Some of the things that we're seeing as breaches um, or the statistics we are seeing is that 74% of cyber professionals say they don't have the skill set in their organization. I don't think you can hire every single person with the right cyber security skill set in your organization at the same time. It's very costly, it's not easy to actually achieve. 27% of organizations said they have experienced what they call a CEO attack. You, all of you that are here, are the biggest targeted person in your organization. The reason is because you don't have the time to look through all the emails and look at the fine print of if you're gonna be hacked or not. And I'll show you today. It's very easy to fake an email from you to him. Let me try that later. It's very easy to do that. And those fine details or prints that you have to look out for, most senior management don't have the time to. And sometimes the tools you have in organizations are not good enough to be able to detect that. That is why the CEOs are the, is the targeted, followed by the finance directors. Because once you get a finance director who can actually um, approve certain details on the system, on the ERPs, that means it will be easy for them to, to actually channel where the money is going. People have lost millions of dollars because of the wrong bank accounts being paid into. It's happening and all of us are potential targets that we are seeing right now. So no one ever thinks they'll be a victim of a cyber attack until it actually happens to them, right? And that's what I was asking if you've ever been hacked before because today I will take you through the mind of a cyber criminal. Let me show you exactly how we think, not how we think, how they think. <laughs> I'm not a cyber criminal, I'm not a hacker. I'm a cyber security engineer and a thought leader, right? So some of the things that we have seen during COVID-19 is insider threats. I put that in bold red or to be the focus because people in your organizations know the systems much better than you do. What happens when you are here and the engineer who is supposed to be there at, at, at night as a support engineer, he's doing something that you can tell. They have access to pass to systems, password. Are you monitoring every single time? How do we know that the external hackers who are coming out there and they're trying to find ways to get inside your network? We're looking at email security, anti-malware solutions, monitoring 24 seven that you have intelligence, not just noise on your network and systems to know that every single thing that is happening, you have visibility and you can actually go back three hours ago to find out who did what, where and why. Do we have those systems? They exist but have they been configured properly to be able to work? We're looking at actual and timely mitigations that if anything happens right now, you should be able to actually get back to your businesses within the shortest possible time because how long do you think your business will run if you stay offline for five hours? You lose a lot of money because every single minute counts. 
every single second counts. If we're looking at business continuity during COVID-19, most of you or most of us have written down on paper a business continuity strategy, but it has never been tested because we don't know when exactly it's going to come into place. How do you send your employees home to say that you can stay at home for the next two, three hours or for the next few days and work from home? Now, work from home has become the normal thing, right? It's the new normal. But all of that is part of business continuity strategy building. So, cybersecurity is no longer about defending your network. It's about the business dynamics are changing. The cyber breaches cannot be our new normal. We can't be waking up every day and being told that we have been hacked, we have been breached. We're having meetings to discuss that. And we have to start thinking of predictive analysis, which is proactiveness rather than reactive. Don't wait for the thing to happen before you actually get to react to it. So we're thinking about our chief information security officers are thinking about applications, data. They're looking at users. They're looking at consumers who are also consuming the products that you have and the services and, of course, Internet of Things. I sat down last night when I arrived in, I live in Kenya by the way, so I came back, I'm Ghanaian but I live in Kenya. I came back yesterday and I was sitting at the hotel, browsing the internet and looking for certain things, internet of things. I landed in somebody's house. I can put off, his, I can put off all his lights, even in the toilet when he's, taking, when, he's having, when he's having his time. His shower, I can put the shower off, I can open his gate, I can open his water sprinkler. If you have time, I can show you that later today. You want to see it? We can, we can go to his house. He can put off anything. And I was not even serious. I was basically just browsing the internet. You can see Tesla cars if you want to put them off. You can see people's homes. You can see cameras in Ghana of people's industries and you can even try to move them around. Anyway, we'll not go there today because... Uh, <laughs> so some of the gaps we've identified is vulnerabilities we have. How do you patch these vulnerabilities to fix them? How do you make sure that we have ways of having, we have insufficient skill set at times and our applications that we develop don't go through what you call a secure development life cycle. Most of us, the times when you are CEOs in a room, you want the product to come out fast. You will tell your engineers, I want this done in two months. They will tell you to be done in three months or four months, but they're like, no. Your competitor is about to roll out that same application faster than you. So we pressurize them to actually release things faster which is not supposed to be the way. And we have general cyber security or cyber resilience for awareness for the staff. You will think the easiest person to hack is the CEO? No, I have hacked the easiest company was the fondest lady. Cologne, shaved, I gave a flash drive to actually print something for me and I got into the, comp the company. This cable you see here is a charger. It looks normal to you, right? But if I was to give this cable to you on your laptop to charge for me, I can trigger anything on your laptop within a kilometer radius away from you. So 100 meters away. And I'll demonstrate that to you to see today. It's not a normal cable that char to charge, but it will charge. If I go to the front desk, I did this actually, went to a bank, I gave the, the front desk lady to charge my phone for me, I triggered a, a command on the laptop to download a malware from somewhere else, run on the laptop, give me access to the, her computer, and you see, if I also hack you, and I ask you to tell me what the person behind you is telling me, you will tell me every detail about him. That was how easy it is. It took me less than 10 minutes to activate that, and that's just because of physical hacking. So there are things that are out there that can be done. So the problem, somebody, uh, it's a CFO who actually gave this code saying, the problem with CISO, CISO stands for Chief Information Security Officers, and the entire cybersecurity field for that matter is that you keep asking for more money and resources but can't guarantee or articulate what I'm buying. They'll shut down that budget because they can't see tangibly what exactly they are paying for because you want to see action. How many of you are, are victims of that? Thank you. Thank you for being honest. It's really important. <laughs> you want to see some attack and then you stop it and you say, oh, the firewall is working. But it doesn't work like that. We have to start getting involved in resilience. That's why there are two comparisons of things. Effectiveness of what you are doing as a, as a, as a company and how, how much is enough for efficiency. This is try to say that when you're thinking about attacks, you want to increase the cost of an attack to an attacker. Hackers don't like to go for things that are difficult. They go for the easiest. Are we together? They go for whatever is easy. They go for whatever they can actually have their, their access to, say, 
is this the easiest person to hack? So they identify the weakest link. So you have to increase the cost of attack. That means you have to get better systems, the better processes. You need to start moving from, from compliance to a risk-based approach. That is one of the key things that we have to take out here, from here. Today, let's not leave here talking about cyber security. We'll talk about cyber resilience. Are we together? Let's start thinking about cyber resilience, which I'll explain a little bit later. Let's not think about cyber security anymore. And also you want to decrease the mean time to remediation. Like I said, being offline for five hours is going, to come, is going to make sure that you lose a lot of money. So you need to make sure that you have a mean time that you can actually remediate whatever has been happening into a way that you can actually get back easily. Efficiency, your risk appetite, mitigation effectiveness, your risk exposure. What is the asset of greatest risk in your organization right now? Is it the CEO's laptop? Is it the database that you have? Or is it the machine that controls the turbines that you have for your industrial communication? It has to be identified that you prioritize and it also helps to actually reduce um, your risks. So you have threats, you have assets in your organization that from a laptop to the TV, to the smart devices you have, to the servers, the databases in the cloud, and you have the ways that they are vulnerable. All of that is what is having a risk. So you will be hacked someday. If you don't believe me, <laughs> then raise your hand. You think you'll be hacked someday? You sure? So can we hack you today? You will be hacked someday. It's just a matter of when. That's why we need to start changing our mindset from a reactive approach to proactive approach. Here are some of the devices that we actually use for hacking these days. And trust me, they're all easy to get. I have every single of these devices in my bag. One of the one on the top left can allow me to be able to plug in flash drives or even take off this Wi-Fi. If I want to spend more time here, anybody who's on their own hotspot, I'll disconnect you from that, take you to my hotspot. You will think it's actually working. It's the same internet, and I'll be able to see every traffic. The watch on the right will be able to, to basically actually de-authenticate you from the Wi-Fi by force. I don't need the password. This is the one that I'm talking about, the cable, the USB Ninja, and the USB Crazy Radio, which is there, actually to save traffic between the mouse and the, key and, the, and the laptop that you have. Everybody have a wireless mouse, right or wrong? A wireless mouse, yes, you do. Majority of the wireless mouse you have can be triggered in a way that as you're clicking, I have a small device in the bag that can actually intercept the traffic and make sure that I can type anything on your laptop as you, the administrator of that laptop. All of these are easy, so a hacker who is determined to hack you will do everything. But the conversation is not about that, it's basically how do we change our mindset? Assume that you have already been compromised, so we can't be start thinking about, we need to know, we can't protect the systems against every single attack. So assume you have been compromised, that you can think of how do you protect the test respondent and along those attack phases. We're looking at a way to design our, our applications, our systems, our network, everything that we have to be able to recover quickly. Not the way that you're thinking to design everything not to fail. Because there are systems, there are, there, are, there, are, there are applications, there are software, they will fail someday. Right? So we're trying to shift our mindset from compliance to risk focus. We're trying to see how do you create a risk profile. Determine the business impact to you, a financial reputation uh, impact, assess, uh, assess the threats that you have, the vulnerabilities, determine what risk that you have and the, and the threat, uh, and treat this risk very importantly. So this is a very short formula. I just put it there because I'll be sharing the presentation to everybody, that you can understand exactly how do you know the risk appetite, the risk profile, and your compliance obligations, which is what you put in Ghana. So I'm gonna take you through a very short live hacking demonstration. So hackers use anything they can find on the internet to be able to get into your network. So I think you can see that on the screen. So if you look at this, this is basically using a search engine to see people's houses. I can look for anything in, in, online using um, these simple tools that are publicly available. So this is a search engine called Shodan, allows you to be able to see almost anything online. These are people's homes that you can log into. I see people having their parties, but anyway, so the focus. Google is very powerful to be able to give you almost anything and everything you want. If I type site G8 and I said file type doc and I said confidential, this basically says I want to see every .gh website, any Microsoft Word document that has the word confidential in it. There we go. So all of these documents you're seeing here, 
they're not really confidential, but they are somewhere on a website that has the word confidential in that document. Same way that I want to see um, people that have text files on their pages, which is saying that they have a password and there's a text file there. These are passwords, I'm not gonna go into them because some of them are showing people's databases and the likes in Ghana, right? And their passwords, same way you want to find Ghanaians who have been compromised before with their Hotmail or Gmail somewhere, and you try to mimic them. So this actually tells you people who have been compromised before, again, I'm not going into it, but you can actually take people's passwords and that same password they have reused that so many times, right or wrong. You've used the same password so many times, at least on five portals. Right? So what happens? How do you even know your password is out there? Because other people have already gotten compro they've compromised you before and they've gotten that data. But I would like to find out exactly who works at a particular place. So let me pick um, some. I just pick. I was looking at the audience, the delegates, and say, I want to find out who says they work at Bank of Ghana. The reason is why I want to find a target. So a hacker will use such as details such as LinkedIn to find the right target of an organization to know do I target the CEO, the CFO, or the details. Now, this is not hacking. This is basically using publicly available information to be able to get what they want. Now, getting those information, what a hacker would do is to use what they call a terminal. A terminal basically is to be able to make sure that we can find details about, say, uh, Bank of Ghana is what? BOG dot? Dot gov, dot gh. I want to find email addresses. I want to find the email structure. How are the emails done? Fine. As that is happening, because I don't have time, I want anybody to give me their email password. No, not email password, the email, uh, your Gmail account. Anybody? Just a sample Gmail. Come on, please volunteer. I want to, start, I want to show you basically what happens, because if I want to pass a bottle of this sanitizer, to the back. What are the ways that we can pass it around? I can either give it to you, pass it, or you can walk to the person. Same way emails work. Emails are work in a way that you can actually manipulate how they actually move from one place to the other because of a protocol that they follow. So can I get an email address? Any Gmail account, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. S-A-I-I-D M-A-S-R-I at gmail.com. Thank you so much, Saeed. So I'm, I'm faking an email from Saeed. I mean, due to time, I'll send it to myself. I'll send it to one of my domain accounts at africahackon.com. Then I, I want to force Saeed to say something, which is uh, lunch for all. All the lunch is on me at Ken Pinsky. So, Saeed, you're buying lunch today. Thank you. <laughs> so, what I've basically done is to fool Google to think that the email is coming from Saeed. And um, let me go to my Gmail. Let us see if that has come. So, as you can see, Saeed has sent an email by now. Even if his picture was there, they would have actually showed his picture. Said, if I was to reply to you saying, thank you very much, you will actually get that email. How many of your employees will actually get salary review and actually open it? Right? Salary review. So imagine, did you get it? I'm sure you did. It should be coming through in the next five seconds. Please confirm to us. So anybody who actually gets salary review, they're going to open it. Hackers will actually send you files that are zipped. Great. So he got an email. And it will look, it looks very legit. Thank you. That is what they'll do. Now, if I fake an email from him as a CEO to everybody saying, this is a salary review, please actually get that running, they'll actually open it. However, they try to do other things to be able to get details about you, and I'll show you very easily. So. They do what we call phishing attacks, which is what has been happening to a lot of people. Phishing attacks is basically mimicking a detail that will actually look very real and make sure people can see. So let's see CEO submit, um, and they create this thing and use what we call link shortness. 
Why they do this is because they want to make sure that they can actually force you to think it's real. Now, if you look at this, you all get for, um, Google Drive links shared to you and it looks very real and they tell you it's, um, it contains, oh, there's a problem there, so I'm gonna show you. But basically, that will be able to mimic the Google page to be able to send you something. Now, if I gather all this information, I'll send it to my friend there who has a laptop. Uh, please come forward so that we can see. Where I've sent him an Excel sheet that is zipped with a password because I don't want Gmail to scan that file to see if there's any malicious content. So when he opens that uh, Excel sheet, just show everybody. He thinks that he's actually browsing an, an Excel sheet, not knowing in the background, I can take over the entire laptop. All I can do, I can activate the camera in the background, I can actually see everything he's doing. I can shut down this laptop if I want to. You can see, you move the camera around with the laptop. But to him, he's actually watching a simple Excel sheet. That's where malwares have been embedded. They're embedded in documents that you don't see every day, right? Just raise a laptop because if I really want to be malicious, all that I want to do is say, I want, oh, by the way, you can actually activate the mic in the background. It will have no effect or shut down the laptop, and that's it. Laptop being shut down. You can open CD-ROM drive, you can do almost anything just because of a simple Excel sheet that we have. There's no much time to show you almost everything that I have to do today, so I'm going to show you the last but not the least. No, anyway, so those are basically some of the easiest ways for you to get compromised, and I know this time. So, we at Dimension Data try to do almost anything and everything when it comes to IT, from intelligent infrastructure to business applications that you have, to security, and we don't just give you products because giving you products is not going to solve the problem. We have to analyze it, investigate details, understand your services and the details that you have that we can actually do a money security for you to be able to customize something that will work for you actively. We have all the qualifications you can think about, no need to actually show you all of that. And last but not the least, as the, Mr. MC comes on stage, like I said, let's not think about cyber security, but cyber resilience. Cyber security is about three elements. Number two, and number two, three, and four. Being able to protect, detect what is happening in networking systems and how do you respond. Cyber resilience, on the other hand, is being able to identify some of these risks that are happening to you. Like I said, we move from a compliance-based to risk-based approach and how do you recover very, very quickly. So with that, there are some details that we have to uh, conversations to ask um, as CEOs in our boardrooms. How do you demonstrate the investment that you have? The, you have to make cybersecurity part of the board strategy. Um, when was the last cyber threat examined? These are some of the questions that you need to start asking and boardroom questions. Uh, this presentation will be shared with everyone, so I don't have to read all, all the details uh, because of time as well. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. My team is... Is, 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 is here, also in the, in the booth. Do come see them, let's see how we can interact, let's have a conversation and be able to see how you can be resilient. So I'll say thank you very much, and oh, this is how my, my room looks like at, at work. <laughs> this is how my, my, my cyber, our cyber threat intelligence. We have been trying to do one major thing, reduce, reduce the amount of time we spend on treating incidents from five hours to eight seconds. If you want to find out, please come to the booth and let's have a conversation. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a very dangerous man walking, Dr. Bright C. Maldo. How about another round of applause? If you're connecting with us, this is the fifth Ghana CU Summit. We're coming to you live from the Kampinski Gold Coast City. It's a tradition unbroken where the biggest conclave of CEOs and business ex executives interact with policymakers and government as we deliberate on important and pertinent issues that affect our economy. Today, we're dwelling on a very important theme, and as a build-up to the theme, we're taking several insights before the arrival of our guest of honor, the Vice President of the Republic. Taking off from our first insight, it is important that we dwell on corporate governance, how to reset the corporate governance agenda for a post-pandemic economic resilience. Clearly, it's obvious to us 
that cyber resilience is a shared responsibility and not limited to only IT professionals. Walking us through this very insightful topic by way of a keynote is a man who is well versed in the corporate boardroom with over four decades of corporate experience spanning eight industries and currently he presides over 20 boards from 10 industries. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome the CEO of the Ghana National Petroleum Company, Dr. KK Sapo. Thank you very much. Our distinguished MC, members of the diplomatic community, Honorable Ministers of State, fellow Chief Executive Officers and business leaders, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I deem it an honor to address this August gathering of business leaders and industry giants from across the world. It's always a great joy to deliberate with fellow CEOs and business leaders on ways of improving the administration of businesses to achieve success. For reasons that are obvious to us all, we meet today in circumstances that are not entirely normal, circumstances that have prompted intense discussions in adapting to a changing world and how to leverage the lessons from the new world to our advantage. I'm certain that we all marvel at how COVID-19 pandemic has led to a paradigm shift that affects all aspects of our lives, including how we manage and administer our businesses. The pandemic has by no means provided numerous lessons to business managers and prompted businesses and institutions to take a second look at the way they do things to ensure their survival. At the core of the lessons learned from the pandemic is the need to transform our business models and processes using digital technology and for this agenda to be initiated by corporate boards and management. In as much as the need for digitization in businesses preceded, preceded the pandemic, it is indeed a pandemic which serves as the unsolicited needed catalyst for targeted action and implementation. Countries still struggle with low with how to manage the crisis and its after effect effectively. If businesses are to recover from the shocks of the pandemic, there will be the need to reset the corporate governance agenda to build business resilience and ultimately sustained economic growth. The corporate governance structure of our businesses is key to building economic resilience to meet our contemporary challenges. Good corporate governance is needed to ensure the proper running of enterprises to engender investor confidence that attracts required equity and risk capital. Good corporate governance ensures economic growth as micro enterprises deliver results. The governance structure of most businesses has been on autopilot, but now, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot do business as usual. The pandemic has revealed the importance of business to society and demonstrated the power of technology in striving to meet the needs of all stakeholders. It has also become increasingly clear that to run productive and profitable businesses, digital transformation is critical. Under the current circumstances and beyond, there is no doubt that the corporate governance agenda should embrace digital transformation for businesses to achieve resilience. A vision of employing digitization for business must be set by boards for management, for implementation by management. 
Technologically literate boards and management are a must-have for all business in today's world. A board that recognizes and appreciates the essence of technology will be of immense benefit to the administration of business. This is so because the board will understand the need to digitize the business and retrain staff to meet the needs of a contemporary technological marketplace. A corporate governance agenda that promotes post-pandemic business and economic resilience will require a more in-depth look at how seriously our boards and executives consider digitization. Suppose the board and management appreciate that technology will lead to revenue growth and improve return on assets, among others. They will reset the agenda from the top and ensure that it is replicated at all levels of the organization. This may even require or may be necessary for the board and management to also receive training. A board committee may also be formed to deal with digital transformation and digital revolution, innovation, to enhance the work of the committee and that of the board. It may also be beneficial to appoint external experts to such a committee. As we recognize the essential role of technology in business, we should be mindful of and swiftly deal with accompanying threats, such as cybercrime, terrorist activities, and intellectual property theft, among others. These are serious issues and threats to te technological innovation to which we must be responsive. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we deliberate on leading our businesses into post-pandemic resilience, we cannot ignore the monumental and commendable work done by the government of Ghana to digitize the economy. The creation of the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization is a pointer to the resolve and commitment of our government to ensure that our dear country is not left behind in the global technology and digital revolution. But one may ask, is the government's effort enough to ensure success? I reckon that good corporate governance in both the private and public sectors is needed as well. As I've indicated already, the Board of Directors and Management will have to take appropriate measures to ensure that a successful technology and di digital revolution is achieved. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I must add that resetting the agenda to achieve business and economic resilience may not rely on only digitization. There are indeed other issues of importance in corporate governance which I, offer, I wish to offer some thoughts on. I would like to talk briefly about four of these. These are making choices to reflect the right boardroom and business cultures, undertaking meaningful corporate social responsibility initiatives, ensuring reasonable gender balance on boards, and committing resources to procure requisite technological infrastructure and for training and retraining staff. It is time for us to reset our choices to reflect a good business culture. Pre-COVID times, I had the opportunity to serve on several boards in Ghana and abroad. Most boardroom culture, from my observation, has lost luster. Some boards also tend to be captured by management for, or a few board members for their own selfish ends. Other boards do not function well because top management withholds information from the board members, thereby limiting meaningful boardroom debate. There are also those boards that have members 
who have no interest in the business of the board because they lack competence, confidence, experience, qualif qualification, and perhaps lack understanding of their role or obligation as board members. I've also seen boards where group alliances based on ethnicity, politics, or religion have led to the coloring of debates, breeding of conflict among board members, and a lack of cooperation in delivering the board's business. Directors need to be appointed based on competence, rather than political, ethnic, or religious considerations. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we cannot manage boardroom business the same way as we have been doing, and expect that we will achieve economic and business resilience. We need to reset the boardroom culture with faithful, objective, healthy, and critical debates to speak to the needs of the contemporary post-COVID-19 business world. Certainly, the days of sleeping, snoring, and agenda-pushing directors should be over. I also like to remind you that our businesses have social responsibility to the good people of Ghana, and, sp and specifically in the communities in which we operate. In recent times, the mantra has been corporate social responsibility. But the question is, how committed are we to take up this responsibility of ensuring that the communities benefit from our activities? I invite corporate Ghana to give generously and meaningfully to society because it is a business imperative to do so and not a favor. The board must not fail in this regard. I also like to emphasize the need to include a reasonable number of competent women on boards. I've had the privilege of working with some wonderful women, such as Mrs. Kofi, Cecilia Kofi, Domot Industries on the Tema Oil Refinery Limited Board, Mrs. Villas, Camelot Ghana Limited, on the Merchant Bank Board, Mrs. Helen Loco on the Ghana Commercial Bank Board, and Ms. Nanadra Hackman on the GMPC Board. I've come to one happy conclusion. Based on my experiences, generally, it is an excellent asset to boardroom culture to have competent women on boards. They are moderating influence when debates are heated. They provide cautious approaches to issues and deliver their positions gracefully. They engage in pre-meeting consultations to generate consensus, but are not easily convinced to support motions that they do not believe in. Overall, they are extremely fair and firm on disciplinary issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about single female representation or mere tokenism, but the inclusion of a reasonable number of competent women on our boards. The wonderful women at least were not just women, but competent, knowledgeable, and skillful. I encourage you to balance gender in your boardrooms, and you'll find, as established by empirical research, that your business will grow to achieve the resilience we all need. Committing resources to technology, infrastructure, and for the training of user employees is a necessity. Else, digitization will be a lip service. Some businesses are not very keen on spending money to retrain staff. Sometimes, for the fear that after acquiring skills and knowledge, such trained employees may leave their business for greener pastures elsewhere. But friends, we cannot work with this dangerous posture. We need to invest in improving the skill set of our workforce so that our businesses will grow and achieve the resilience required. We should remember that COVID-19 changed how we live. 
work and do business. If our staff are not retrained to do business using technology, and if they lack the necessary equipment to work with, our businesses will lose its significance in the world. Work is now by touch of button, and we should give our, work, our workforce the opportunity to engage in business, in the business. We must budget and commit financial resources to procure technology and retain our workforce to achieve businesses and economic resilience. This is a tax that the board, the board must not fail. Ladies and gentlemen, digitization is key to the future of businesses and our society at large. Resetting the corporate governance agenda post-COVID-19 will require strong, fearless, and a competent leadership. I would like to take this opportunity to employ all business leaders to initiate this discussion in their various workplaces. Business leaders, leaders must become more proactive in adopting and implementing digital solutions. On this journey, we should ensure the right board culture, maintain a commitment to society, install a boardroom with diverse competencies and a decent number of female representations. Provide financial resources to acquire the needed technological infrastructure and train our employees. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I encourage us all to freely share ideas in the various discussions as we will have at this, we will have at this summit. And to remember that at all times, the success of our organization depends to a large, a large extent on us. Now is the time, more than ever, to encourage dialogue among the various organs of our institutions and ensure that our dialogue produces results that are favorable to all. I wish you, I wish us all, I'm a participant, fruitful deliberations at this summit. Thank you for your attention. The CEO of the Ghana National Petroleum Company, Dr. K.K. Sapong, thank you ever so much. And so if you're joining us, it is the fifth Ghana CEO Summit. We do this every year, a tradition unbroken, where business leaders come together to deliberate on key pertinent issues affecting the economy. This year, we're dwelling on the theme, digital transformation, powering business and government research for a post-economic resilience, a private-public sector dialogue. In moving on, it's important that we acknowledge the indispensable role of the public sector and for this reason, we're joined by the Director General of the State's Interest and Governance Authority to share a statement. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Stephen Asamwa Wati. Ministers of State present here, members of the Diplomatic Corps, fellow CEOs, our media partners, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to be here and to participate in the fifth edition of the Ghana CEO Summit. I want, to, I want to salute my brother and a friend who incidentally comes from my hometown, from Sorbonne, Mr. NSAJ, for putting up this wonderful program. And the team at the CEO Network and all the partners put, for putting up these events. Indeed, the CEO Summit has become a signature event in the calendar of corporate Ghana. Like a similar event that I organized when I was serving President J. Kufo, called the National Economic Dialogue, the CEO Summit brings together business leaders brings together policy makers and for us to think together, work together, collaborate together 
and make sure we make Ghana a better place. The authority which I lead, the State Interest and Governance Authority, SIGA to be short, which has the ownership and oversight responsibilities over state-owned enterprises, SOEs, the state interest in all joint venture companies and other state entities in Ghana, we fully endorse this program. SIGA has been set up to become a hub of public sector excellence operating with a private sector mindset to ensure that all state entities deliver on their mandate efficiently and where appropriate, profitably. We deem it as a high value platform for CEOs in both public and private sector to interact within the environment and exchange ideas and to improve the quality of leadership in corporate Ghana. I am proud that we are partnering with the CEO Summit to ensure success of this year's summit. I trust that our partnership will consolidate the platform and help deliver superior gains for the benefit of all stakeholders. As we battle our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic, business leaders and policymakers must be mindful that the path of recovery is going to be daunting. While we strengthen our governance systems, we also need to be agile to be able to respond efficiently. While we also strive to redeem lost revenue and improve our bottom lines, we also need to focus on sustaining the jobs of our numerous employees. While we also seek to urge out our competitors, we also must find creative ways to collaborate with industry players. The new normal after the COVID-19 will require sophisticated leadership that is able to balance competing interests to be able to thrive and to succeed. And we need to work together to achieve this. The summit's theme of digital transformation, powering business and governance reset for a post-pandemic economic resilience a public-private sector dialogue resonates and aligns with SIGA's quest to drive President Anna Adodankwa Akufuado's post-pandemic economic recovery efforts. Our particular interest is in the public-private sector dialogue that ensures return on investment and also business development that solves pertinent national problems with particular emphasis on the poor and the vulnerable in our communities. This is a game-changing opportunity for government and CEOs of state-owned enterprises to deepen our strategic partnership with the private sector. Such a partnership promotes opportunity for both sides to learn from each other best practices, policy propositions, and leadership insights that inspire business and economic transformation in the country. Through such exchanges, we can explore pathways to addressing the economy's, the economy's most significant challenges. At SIGA, we believe that public sector CEOs need to work hand in hand with their private sector counterparts to achieve their mandate. Our mandate at SIGA enjoins us to oversee the state interest in specified entities and to ensure shareholder value 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the Republic. And now, the national salute. Please be seated. Thank you, my boss. Welcome. Let me continue. Our partnership in this event is to help chart a new course of partnership with the private sector. A strategic partnership that is based on shared interest, inclusive prosperity, and sustainable growth. Leveraging the opportunities offered by the CEO Summit will enable us to remix our leadership styles, transform businesses, and change the way we do business in the private sector. As you know, the government of President Akufuado has made digitalization an integral part of our strategy to improve corporate governance and to reduce corruption in the public sector. We are therefore excited at the summit's focus on digital transformation as a pillar for regaining our economic momentum as businesses and, and as a country. It is our hope that as we engage, we shall learn from each other to reinforce areas where we are getting, we are getting it right and to correct areas where we are getting it wrong. As we continue to stretch our minds through such high level engagement and work towards tangible outcomes, I have no doubt that together we will win the battle over the pandemic and build a resilient and prosperous Ghana beyond aid. Our partnership with the CEO Summit will mean we do not come here for just two days in the year and forget about you. Indeed, Ernest and myself will be around. We will follow up the summit conclusions. We are here to serve you and help you clear the hurdles for you to achieve your business goals. Mr. Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, fellow CEOs, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. The Honorable Stephen Asamwa Boateng is the Director General of the State's Interest and Governance Authority, an organization whose time has come to streamline and address oversight and coordination challenges which have bedeviled our state enterprises and to ensure that they are productive and profitable. We say thank you very much for the great work and may God strengthen you to do more. Speaking into our broad theme, Digital Transformation Powering Business Government Research, for a post-economic resilience, a private public sector dialogue. And now, Mr. Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pride to welcome up here a government entity which is also doing very well a part of SIGA. I'm talking about GCB Bank. Would you please make welcome our platinum sponsor and the CEO, Mr. Kofi Adumako. The Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Dr. Mahamudu Baumia, Honorable Ministers of State, fellow CEOs, industry giants, head of partner institutions, leaders, leadership and, part, and facilitators of the CEO Summit, Ghana, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm very grateful to the leadership of the Ghana CEO Network for the invitation to speak 
on the theme Digital Transformation. I consider this summit critical to shaping thought leadership in our quest to take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution in a bid to unlock our transformative capacity for a competitive and resilient digital economy. The African rising narrative has been tutored by economic experts and development agencies over the past few years to emphasize the continent's potential to become a major global player. In recent years, the ICT sector in Africa has continued to grow, a trend that is likely to continue. Of late, mobile technologies and services have generated 1.7 million jobs, both in the informal and formal sector. They have contributed $144 billion of economic value, that is 8.5% of GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa, and contributed $15.6 billion to the public sector through taxation. This trend is definitely set to continue, with a digital economy expected to be worth 25% of global GDP by 2025. It is against this backdrop that Africa, and Ghana for that matter, must continue to adopt and expand its use of digital technologies in order to leapfrog the continent's challenges and drive towards sustainable and inclusive economic development. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I recall the Vice President in 2019 when he reiterated this transformative potential when he explained a digitized formal economy is a crucial plank of Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. The digitization agenda was therefore clearly set. And like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also said, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to accelerate the, the challenge of change. Indeed, COVID-19 presents an urgent and critical need to facilitate our digitalization agenda, drive across every facet of our national life, it has profoundly revolutionized the way our customers want to be served and therefore the way businesses must operate. This is forcing investment in remote working technologies, driving the need for improvement in deployment of digital solutions and the identification of novel ways of adding value. From my perspective, Ghana's digitalization drive can be anchored strategically around three interrelated stakeholder points. A digitally enabled government, a digitally enabled private sector, and a digitally enabled citizen. Over the past few years, the government of Ghana has taken important and commendable steps in driving the digitization agenda. The development of a comprehensive digital address system, the establishment of a credible and secure national identity system, the harmonization of the taxpayers' identification numbers and the national ID numbers, for example, are key to the development of our national digital infrastructure. A credible and comprehensive identity system has implications for every aspect of our national life. From mitigating identity fraud, fighting crime, and improving tax compliance. Apart from being the foundation for a more comprehensive digitization strategy, it will also unlock a new level of credit access at potentially affordable rates 
for the well-being of every Ghanaian by providing a platform for building a reliable credit scoring system. I read with interest how countries like the UAE have a minister for artificial intelligence to drive the country's artificial intelligence strategy. Rwanda and Ethiopia both have ministries of technology and innovation. I am therefore particularly excited that digitalization has been added to Ghana's communication ministry to give digi digitization the requisite attention as part of Ghana Beyond Aid goal of becoming a leader in innovation, digital technology by 2023. This is highly commendable. In Ghana, as the case in many African countries, business led by banks, telecommunication firms, and fintechs have been instrumental in driving the deployment of digital technology by developing unique solutions that work with the limitations of the existing ecosystems. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me to point out that a comparative study on digitization and, in its, and its impact on economic development between sub-Saharan African countries and OECD countries, such as Austria, Belgium, and Norway, brought some interesting findings to the fore. While the effect of broadband internet is minimal for sub-Saharan Africa as compared to OECD countries, the impact of mobile telecommunications is higher in sub-Saharan Africa compared to OECD counterparts. This phenomenon is largely due to the ability of developing countries maximizing the usage of mobile technology and other less developed technologies to develop innovative, context-specific solutions. It is no surprise, therefore, that Africa and Ghana is classified as a world leader in mobile banking, money transfer, and small transactions using mobile technologies. Ghana's private sector has played an integral role in this regard, and it is time to deepen game-changing partnerships, particularly between private sector and the government, to speed up the digitalization agenda. As the leading bank in Ghana, GCB has been at the forefront of financial inclusion agenda since its inception, diligently meeting the financial needs of the people of Ghana with a great success. I am proud to announce on the 10th of April this year, G-Money, Ghana's first bank-led mobile money service, registered a million plus customers with a year within a year of its operation. Let me use this occasion to express my appreciation to our customers for partnering with us in the country's quest for a cash-like society. This proves GCB's commitment to offer the public not only bank-based financial services, but also provide a more broad-based platform to serve other customers who may not have been able to transact through the banking system. This milestone which took place in one year shows how quickly and impactful the deployment of digital technologies can be. In championing our leadership role as the pioneer and largest national bank, we have initiated and broadened stakeholder engagement to leverage the G-Money platform as an industry-wide wallet for all banks. This creates favorable opportunity for competition by aggregating our huge customer base and data. On the back of a successful industry-wide partnership, we will be able to significantly improve the payments landscape and drive the financial inclusion agenda in a cost-effective manner. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, 
Another important and often overlooked element in the digital stakeholder equation is the creation of digital citizens. Research reveals that the digital divide is more pronounced in sub-Saharan Africa due to significant differences in digital skills between different employment and education status groups, between rural and urban areas, and between younger and older persons. In Ghana, whilst many young people are already adept at utilizing digital and social media technologies, there seems to be a lack of awareness amongst the general population about the impact of digital technologies on economic development. Creating a digital, a digitally enabled citizenry will ensure that individuals in the country understand the bigger digitalization discussion and its impact on their lives. It also ensures that citizenry is digitally literate across our educational system and has the requisite skill to utilize digital technology to drive the adoption and use of digital products and services. Finally, it ensures that citizens have access to the requisite digitization infrastructure. It is therefore my hope to see more public-private partnerships extending the coverage of digital infrastructure. While pursuing these goals, ladies and gentlemen, we must take cognizance of the inherent risks associated with digital transformation, such as cybersecurity, fraud, data and privacy breaches. While the government of Ghana has put in place policies and structures through institutions like the Data Protection Commission to safeguard personal data, corporate organizations also have a responsibility. We need to continually invest in security infrastructure and also offer capacity building opportunities to keep all stakeholders abreast of these issues. The good news for Ghana remains the strong political will to drive through Ghana's digitization expectations. Ghana's digitization efforts have been gathering steam over the past few years because it is largely driven passionately by leadership. Likewise, we, as CEOs and business leaders, must create an enabling environment for digitalization to thrive. It is imperative that business leaders drive critical policy initiatives that will lead to Ghana's structural and economic transformation. While acknowledging the corporate giants like GCB and other players represented here have been at the forefront of helping the government, or the government to enforce the drive the needed and to enforce the drive and needed change. We still need to do more, nevertheless. We have to be digitalization champions in our various sectors. This CEO summit should be a springboard that reaffirms our commitment to Ghana's digital transformation agenda. Rather than implementing fragmented individual interventions, it is key for business leaders and technology innovators to come together to collaborate on the reinvention of products, processes, technologies, and culture through digital transformation. A key part of this collaboration should be exploring how to increase efficiency and agility with operational excellence while creating customer-obsessed experiences that grow revenue and reinvigorate businesses including the acquisition of new customers. Your Excellency, distinguished and ladies and gentlemen, this will accelerate the development of a more comprehensive digitization ecosystem that allows us to harness the immeasurable opportunities it presents to our businesses and more importantly, the communities we serve. As I close, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
allow me to commend the organizers of this event for creating a forum to move the digitalization agenda forward. I look forward to participating in subsequent sessions that will surely reset Ghana, our beloved nation, for prosperity through digital transformation beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Kofi Adumako, a faithful steward at the helm of Ghana's greatest asset, the GCB Bank, thank you for all your work in promoting the bank as a center of excellence. One more time, ladies and gentlemen. And talking about excellence, Mr. Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite up here a platinum sponsor who's been in the business of providing great A office spaces within the city. Ladies and gentlemen, Eris Property, the CEO, Mr. Enoch Entua Mensa. Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, fellow CEOs, I decided to change the phase of our presentation this morning by recommending one very able female to handle this morning's presentation. When Dr. K.K. Sapon was talking, he did indicate the fact that we need to make an effort to appoint a lot more female into the boardroom. I have elected one of my able assistants, Nana Abasegua Debi, to handle this presentation for this morning. Nana. Your Excellency, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, CEOs present, I'd like to thank Enoch for this opportunity given me. Um, basically, I'm here to talk about the bold new normal, return to workplace strategies for Ghanaian corporates. So one would ask, why are we talking about technology and then we would introduce workplaces? So a study conducted by Deloitte says that about 30% of organizations would still stick to working remotely, but about 70, particularly in developing countries, would go back to work. And that's the essence of this presentation. So as corporates, as business organizations, we need to start re-strategizing on how we would go back to work. Next slide. So basically, Ares Property is a property development firm it's backed by an institutional real estate fund called Momentum African Real Estate Fund. It's about 205 million USD private equity fund that looks at grade A offices and other commercial properties such as, work, um, such as warehouses, um, call it um, offices, and then retail. Um, Momentum's, Momentum's strategy is a very unique one because it blends Areas, um, call it experience of over 25 um, years in property development with the Momentum Global Investment Management Fund. Um, I'm not going to bore you with COVID-19, but one has to know that COVID-19 was very unique in terms of impact on organizations. When you look through the other recess or, or recessions that we've had, you would realize that organizations did not have, were not properly, might not have properly been prepared on their balance sheet. But during COVID-19, we had just come out of the global crunch and businesses were in their top most position. Within the commercial real estate sector, one of the areas that was greatly affected was hospitality, entertainment, retail, industrial, corporate residential, and some office markets were more resilient than the others. So I'm going to speak to this presentation with this background, with this Deloitte diagram. And it says that for every crisis, there's basically three time frames where you respond by basically um, um, dealing with the present situation and managing business and managing business continuity, recover where companies learn and employ strategies to emerge stronger and thrive where companies prepare for and shape the new normal. So I want this diagram to be at the back of your mind while we go through my slide. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so Power COVID SUTA, which is one of the developments by Momentum Africa Real Estate Fund and managed by ERIS, um, had everything basically in place. So this was our main reception. Next slide, please. Basically, we had spacious terrace for corporate breakout sessions. And we had a coffee shop. So SUTA is located at, just around the ridge runabout. Next slide. We had access control. So the importance of this slide is the essence of smart um, building management systems, where basically um, tenants did not have to touch anything. Basically, come in, you swipe your card, and you go inside the building. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide. We had spacious lobbies, properly designed offices. We had spacious car parking accommodating 4.30. My CEO always says we should boast about this because it's the only commercial building in Accra that basically has adequate parking. Next slide, please. We have an access control car parking. Basically, swipe again. So, in responding, so I'm just going to use Eris Dana as a case study on how we responded and how we basically, um, what's it called, um, 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 recovered and then thrived. Um, so in responding to COVID-19, we had to first of all be compliant to government directive. The government directive was in March was for a lockdown, a complete lockdown. And so we had to immediately lock down all our properties. Now when the president came and reopened the economy, we had to look at ways that we could re-strategize and move our business forward. And in responding to COVID-19, what the first thing that we did as a landlord was we understood the liquidity challenges that businesses almost immediately had from COVID-19. And so we had to re-engage our tenant. As a very sensitive landlord, we had to look at payment structures that we could agree with tenants um, for, for them to be able to pay and not, and not, and not um, defect on payment. We put in all the COVID-19 protocols where basically you come into our building and then you don't have to touch anything, you wash your hands and move in. The essence of this presentation is to highlight um, digitalization, which in our real estate business would be the smart building management systems. So basically smart building management system is incorporating technology and the traditional facility management or building management um, ways of doing things where, for example, you have an access and security control boardroom, you have um, a digital way of operating all the chillers, which we know as air conditioners in the entire building. Next slide, please. So basically putting an automated COVID-19 protocol system. And again, emphasize the smart building management system where immediately the bullets there um, um, senses a human being, it would automatically open up for, for you to walk through. Next slide, please. And then what we also did in, re, in, in, in responding was to basically put motion sensor taps and dispensers in all our bathrooms, just to give people or employees the comfort not to touch anything when they visit the, the washrooms. What we also did was to make sure that we were socially distancing within our elevators, just to give, again, uh, tenants and employees working in the building comfort. Um, there was regular disinfection of reception and lift lobbies where we were doing it within every hour for, um, for these guys to come and disinfect the place. Just again, to emphasize that the place was, was, was COVID-19 free or was tenants were able to comfortably come into the building and work. Next slide. There was very thorough attention to details, so basically making sure that all the elevator buttons is properly cleaned. Our recovery plan. So we know in the beginning of 2021, a lot of people had come to buy into the era of working from home. But again, by the nature of some businesses, some organizations, you would, you would have to go back to work. And so the most important critical things um, in re-strategizing your return to work strategy, strategies was density reduction, sanitation and employee support measures. Um, and on density reduction, that's where my company comes in, where we have very large um, floor plates where you can basically reconfigure your space and allow for um, social distancing. 
Okay, so this is SETA. We still have space to go. Um, and so you can come to our booth just in the corridor when we are done with this, with this presentation. The last point that I want to dwell on is government reset. So as a real estate fund, we want to employ governments to basically look at REITs. We know that it's a pipeline work, but it's something that we really want to, we really want to get it going because this is the time where we, we reset in the economy. It's the time where we would be able to attract real estate funds such as MARIF. And again, Ares as a property development firm looks at um, strategies to help in public organizations to rent to own. So it's important that both public um, organizations also feel free to approach us where we as a fund would look at acquiring a building on your behalf and giving you very flexible payment structure to be able to own in a long term. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was said that a digitally aligned government must reflect in a digitally aligned society. The words of Mr. Kofi Adumako, which brings us to the keynote address to be delivered by the CEO of the Margins Gap Leading Entity Company, spearheading digitization to secure access and more. Would you please make welcome Mr. Moses Baden Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, do not Wonderful to be back once again in human form instead of remotely in a meeting like that. Last year we missed the CEO and I thank NSAG, the founder and convener of the CEO Summit for inviting me to give a keynote address at this 2021 fifth CEO Summit, share my thoughts on the power of digital identities in resetting Ghana's economy. Your Excellency, Vice President, Honorable Ministers, members of the Diplomatic Corps, fellow Chief Executives, Captains of Industry. In 2017, I had the privilege of delivering a keynote address on the fourth Industrial Revolution. And its relevance to moving our economy forward. And that dialogue focused on the opportunities that were presented to leapfrog Ghana into a new digital, social, economic, and political future. And I made six key points that I'd like to reiterate again in concluding that keynote address. I said in 2017 that digitally constrained economies are deficient largely because they have yet to establish a digital ecosystem that can capitalize on the benefits of digitization. I also said at this point too that we must take advantage of our demographic dividend with our youthful population to train our youth with new digital skills that will enrich them to enter the modern digital economy and enable, enable them to scale globally. I called for the rethink of our educational system and the optimization of our curriculum so that it would be more pragmatic and suitable for this digital age. The fourth point I made was that our businesses must digitize and be data-driven to allow us to compete and strive for excellence globally globally, with, the deep, with new digital systems, processes, and tools that are now available to all of us to scale globally. I also called for the building of a meritocratic and values-based environment that promotes a pursuit of efficiency and productivity, an environment that will create and grow digital entrepreneurs who will build a digital infrastructure that will expand our companies and our country's economy. I call for the government to become a digital market maker and to create the best environment within which Ghana will become a destination of choice for businesses globally, both physically and digitally. I also call for a successful transformation of our economy through the changes of policies and laws which are realigned to be relevant to the digital age. Key elements of these policy and legal reviews were to be 
the protection of intellectual property, the respect, commitment, and enforcement of contractual rights that are crucial to the growth of a modern digital economy. I identified also 14 essential features of the digital age that underpin the fourth industrial revolution and digital transformation agenda and that will have rapidly, rapidly accelerated the digital speed of our economy. Now, one of the key elements of those 14 features was a call for a national electronic, digital, and biometric identification system. And so based on those key 14 features, let me now direct my attention to the immediate topic of a digital electronic identity and its impact on the national economy of Ghana post-COVID-19. COVID-19 has demonstrated to us everything that we talked about in 2017. It's accelerated the realization of companies and individuals in our country on the importance of digitization and the need for being able to do business through digital channels more efficiently and to transact business contactless. For us at the Badgers Group, we have been already prepared four years prior to that in resetting ourselves in the new digital um, platform to ensure that when COVID struck, not only did we not see any drop in efficiency of or um, business activity, but we actually thrive better as most of our members were able to work remotely using digital platforms and collaboration in documents and uh, computing in the cloud and conducting business with various video conferencing tools and platforms. Despite that, most of our partners, both local and international, were not ready because they had not adopted the digital systems that we kept advising them on. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most significant global disruption of our time and has completely transformed the way in which we live and interact with one another. Digital adoption has taken a quantum leap at both organizational and niche industry levels and customer needs now demand offerings that reflect new health and hygiene sensitivities. Cashless transactions, remote working practices, and virtual classrooms to educate our children are now part of the new normal. People prefer contactless transactions that are giving their patronage to companies who are invested in digital tools that are able to facilitate these transactions. Companies are no longer competing locally, but on a global scale. In 2020 alone, the mobile money interoperability platform in Ghana recorded, all, recorded almost up to 100 billion in contactless, in contactless payments, contactless mobile payments, which is a 5.536.2 percent increase from the year before. Now, now what's, why is such a quantum loop leap? Well, of course, it's because of COVID-19. I'd like to congratulate our vice president for the initiative for interoperability in payments, which made this possible. So when COVID arrived, we were ready with mobile and contactless payments. That is what I mean by saying that government must become a digital market maker for the private sector. Bank of Ghana recently has been issuing PHP license for digital wallets to support an increasingly massive increase in digital transactions. The entire supply chain has been disrupted. disrupted. Items can be ordered online and delivered straight to your doorsteps right here in Accra from Wache to Catfish. There is no longer a pressing need to travel to obtain items you want. That is probably very expensive for husbands because of late, my wife has taken to shopping on exclusively on Instagram, which means money goes out of my wallet faster. The impact on service delivery business have been forced to innovate to stay afloat, resulting in efficient delivery services. Notably, just a few weeks ago, Tesla announced that it was accepted Bitcoin, which means Mr. Governor, the digital currency area is open us. Although, just days ago, they rescinded that decision because of the carbon footprint associated 
with massive energy consumption by supercomputers used to mine coins by crypto mining businesses. But that does not change the fact that the digital currency is approaching. Even funerals have been transformed and are taking place live on live streaming platforms and donations are being received quite efficiently digitally and food delivered in packs. The world has indeed changed and technology has taken center stage. Today, digital identities are more important than they ever have been before. We are a community of people that now need to be verified on multiple flat platforms guarded by physical and logical access control systems. Just take around a look around this room. Our faces are still covered in masks. You can understand the U.S. says after our second job, we probably can do without masks. We hope that time comes. But if you are wearing a mask, who are you really? Can you be who you claim you are? Or is an imposter pretending to you? In the digital world, even scarier, identities are stolen daily and billions of dollars are lost as a result of identity fraud. To be safe, we must rely on our electronic digital avatars to safely connect us through secure devices to product services and solutions in order to ensure that the digital infrastructure that we build does not crumble because of crime and illegal transactions done on our behalf by marked men, not your fiscal marked man, but your digital masked avatar. Our communities have been challenged to think differently and innovate in order to survive the health and economic sources of this pandemic. Policymakers and citizens must adopt a multi-sectoral approach to harness innovation and emergency technologies, both locally and globally. This means regulation needs to catch up, as it unfortunately continues to lag behind the ingenuity of the digital space, its dynamism and its speed. So, if digital identities are important and we need to protect them, the question is, let me attempt to define what an electronic digital identity is and break it down in layman's terms before I go into the rather technical industry description of it. In layman's terms, a digital identity is what enables people to verify on a platform, on computers, on portals, and on the internet that you are who you claim you are and there's a certain digital history behind you that confirms transactions that you do. So your username, your passwords, your basic behavior, and other information on you, the date of birth, and your unique numbers like a social security number, your online, it's all part of your digital identity. But that's in the, in the broad sense. However, a digital identity, in a technical sense, it's a simple, unique primary identifier for people normally from cradle to grave in the case of individuals, which is an essential foundation for identification. In the USA, it is a social security number. In Denmark, it is a CPR number. In the UK, it's a national health insurance number. In Ghana, it's a Ghana card pin that identifies each person in the national identity register and ensures that they exist only once in the database. Now that's the first step. The number is then attached to data fields on the registration form that contains all the identity data fields collected by both public and private organizations. In the case of the National ID Register, Ghana's Register, citizens are required to go through an interview, establish a legal identity, provide the proper uh, birth certificate or passport, which is then verified through an interview, and then after that, their biometrics are taken and attached to that unique number and that data pieces, and, and the data fields that are collected by all identity collecting institutions. In addition, a digital address is added to, to that data set. And then the data set in real time to an automatic biometric identification system that looks through the database in a matter of seconds, approximately three seconds, and returns the data that shows that you're not, you don't exist twice in the database. Information is then personalized to the Ghana card. A digital certificate, which is an end user PKI, is then put in it. And this card has three interfaces. One is an ICAO passport, which is for 
sanctions for travel in West Africa and hopefully with sanctions for travel globally. The other profile is an EID profile that meets international standards. It's open and it's interoperable to all digital platforms who have the right interfaces. So it means as a Ghanaian, you can authenticate your identity anywhere in the world, provided they are inter inter in you're inter interacting with a, a portal that is, has a standard security interfaces, whether online or in person. The card also has another profile, which is a match on card profile that can, can compare your live biometrics with the biometric storage in your card in real, in, real, in real time and confirm that you are who you are. It also allows the um, SPKI certificates authorized by the country certificate authority of nature and then also digitally signed by a sub-certificate authority of the National Identification Authority. This card can carry public and private keys and certificates that allows you to interact digitally, remotely, and in person across multiple complex platforms, digital platforms. So that's the Ghana card for you. With the national ID having, uh, having crossed the 50 million mark, that means the 50 million people plus have a digital avatar on themselves, an electronic ID that's secure to international standards to be able to carry out digital transactions, both private and public. In this regard, I must applaud the government, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, for evolving and implementing an electronic and biometric identity system, which was the first put on tender in 2003. First put on tender in 2003. And now between 2019 and 2020, the National ID Authority, which is our public partner, registered over 15 million Ghanaians just in one year. Well, we hadn't been able to do that for over 20 years. Now, over 50 million people were also successfully issued electronic identity cards during the mass registration exercise. What is the effect of all this? An electronic national identity register will transform our economy and exponentially increase its digital index and grow our GDP. Citizens can access government services electronically and securely and make payments based on a certified legal identity that is robust, secure, and prevents fraud and financial crime. Compliance will be without a human interface and will have the real-time, date, time, and location stamp with any identity transaction by a number that is generated by NID, NIA and confirmed to the persons who they claim they are. To Vice President, I can see that the mobile payments will double in volume if they can be made more secure, which means the current issues that we have with people impersonating and, and, and you know, perpetuating fraud on people in the mobile money ecosystem will be completely eliminated because people will be who they claim they are. We can overcome the frustration of human interfaces which creates inefficiency and breeds corruption in the access of government services. The robust and secure Ghana card electronic identity will prevent fraud which is perpetrated by stolen identities, fake identities, and multiple identities created to facilitate crime. A clean national identity register will create a clean digital ecosystem and a transparent government and e-commerce digital environment that will help us fix the country. The government has started implementing policies to deepen the digitization of all government services. And the Vice President of the Republic, which is nicknamed the, the Digital Doctor, <laughs> has recently announced new policy initiatives that are in the right direction. Key amongst these policies are the Ghana card pin to replace tax, so that everybody can pay their equitable share of tax. And, and some people will be less burdened, overburdened. The Ghana pin to replace that has also recently been announced, ensuring that our social security transactions will now be connected to identity and fraud and uh, delivery of pensions will be faster and more efficient. The Ghana card pin to replace national health insurance, which will take the fraud out of national insurance, health insurance providers, etc., ensure that people are getting the right medicines and they are who they claim they are. The government payroll recently was announced by the Vice President, I think a few weeks ago, to be validated with the Ghana pins which means that all those who own ghosts in 
government institutions <laughs> will be disappointed, but that will save the country a lot of money. The banking KYC transactions and um, bank transactions to be validated with Ghana card and PIN we will ensure that we are not never blacklisted again and that money laundering will not be entertained in our environment and the transactions will be validated with real people behind it. SIM re-registration to be conducted with a Ghana card will also ensure that we clean our telecom industry system, uh, SIM box fraud and terrorism and criminal activity will be a thing of the past. Our Minister of Communication and Digitization has given a deadline for the start of SIM registration using the Ghana card and is ready to rule out the issuance of public key infrastructure certificates that will give our electronic devices, applications, websites, etc. a digital identity certificate that is connected to our Ghana card. This will allow citizens to facilitate electronic transactions safely on the internet whilst weeding out the 419 and Sakawa scammers. Hopefully, this will result in Ghana being whitelisted and having Ghana IP addresses with genuine certificates. This will allow our country to engage globally in the global digital market as a trusted partner. So, let me conclude by saying that the digital ID provides a secure digital foundation infrastructure upon which our legal identity devices, websites, and other important applications and systems can be built. Post COVID-19, our digital habits will not revert to the, to the old, old habits of analog habits. The digital ecosystem is now on steroids. If we want to succeed in this present and in the future, we need to harness its power and not be consumed by it. This CEO summit will no doubt provide invaluable insight on how our beloved country, Ghana, businesses and individual, individuals can leverage digital to be successful post-COVID-19. We can fix it if we envision the future and plan for digital. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Moses Baden, a man whose boundless enthusiasm has shown through this summit right from its beginning up until now. Please, another round of applause. Mr. Vice President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is worthy of note that there are some positive cases of what post-COVID logistics in Africa looks like right here in Ghana, taking up challenges and seizing opportunities, the Meridian Port Services Digital Transformation case. Would you please make welcome the CEO, Mr. Mohamed Samara. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here to share with you our experience with uh, digitalization and transformation of the container terminal industry in Ghana to something of a world class. And uh, I want to really, in, in person, thank His Excellency, the Vice President, who drove this initiative from the day that he entered into office. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the success that I will demonstrate. Basically, Meridian Port Service, just a quick background. Meridian Port Services, a joint venture company between Ghana Ports and Harbor Authority and two of the world's biggest container operators, AP Muller Terminal and Bolloré. MPS took a concession in 2004 to build and operate a container terminal inside the existing harbor back then, that's Tama Port. And been operating this port since 2007. Basically, the area that was given that you see, it was all warehouses and car parks, etc., was transformed in 2000, well, went into construction in 2005, into 2006, and then containers started to appear. Eventually, this was Terminal 2 that was built and started operation in 2007. When we started business in the port, the ship size was anywhere between 1,500 TE, that's 20 foot equivalent units, to 2,000. Ships started to grow to 3,000 almost. And then Maersk launched what is known the WAF Max. That's the West Africa maximum size vessel that can come, which is a 5,000 TEU vessel. Now, this vessel could not enter Tamaport fully laden. We had some few handicaps. The depth, 
the length of the ship, the height of the ship under crane, then the outreach of the crane. So we couldn't fit the port with cranes big enough to handle this ship. Also, the harbor basin could not take this vessel in, which prompted the investment in a new port infrastructure. And this port infrastructure that you see here, this is an artist impression. To the left is the new one, to the right is the old one. And this is to scale, actually. So the size is huge, and also we built it with the design criteria for 100 years. 100 years in terms of durability, also growth within the harbor basin. This arm that you see, which is called breakwater, this breakwater is actually is a pyramid with a base of 100 meters, more than a football pitch, and it's three and a half kilometer long. So Egyptians were building pyramids on land. We built it in Ghana with Ghanaians underwater. So we took it from the beach. This is actually exactly Terminal 3 beach site, probably beginning of 2017. And this is how it looked like. This is phase one completed. And then phase two still under construction. Phase two, also the berth here is completed. And we are currently finishing this site to make the first burst operational. Phase one was completed seven months, seven months ahead of schedule, which was a very big successful story. Phase two will be completed eight months ahead of schedule. This picture is what you see here is a 3D matrix containers being stored in a 3D matrix. And those blue gantry cranes, they move around, taking coordinates from satellite, and every box has a position using the DGPS, which is the Differential Global Positioning Systems. So containers are identified by a global positioning system on our, in our ports in Ghana, not in Europe. And we work 24-7. The old port didn't work 24-7. If you see the picture behind you, this is how we operate at night. Accra lights are in the background like a Christmas tree, you know, and we are operating in almost broad daylight in this terminal. Now, what did that, what did that make that happen? Certainly. The, the, the digitalization and the transformation of the manual operation into kind of seamless, paperless digital flow. I remember in your visit, Your Excellency, you insisted on everything. And we took notes of those listed items. And we have back then had our operating system Navis, which we upgraded. But we added a gate operating system. We, operated, we added also a track appointment system. Your Excellency, when you visited, the digital penetration into MPS was 3%. Today is 90%, Your Excellency. Thanks to all of these systems. We have the, the track appointment system and biometric control. Every driver that drives a truck into Tama is already pre-registered with his the biometrics. Every truck is registered with his number as well as an RFID, radio frequency identification on his screen. License plate recognition and we have optical character OCR recognition that read container numbers. We have way bridges, every driveway has a way bridge, and we have the most sophisticated scanners in this world. Basically, this is the ecosystem that we created with the stakeholders, and everything exchanged data digitally. 
So this has a lot of benefits, you know, an added value to the security of the data, the speed of the transaction, and the accuracy of everything. Safeguarding the state border security, as well as the revenue earned at that point. I mean, I don't want to, I'm told, you know, we have to go move, move fast, but we will share this with the audience. But basically, it starts with the shipping line, updating the ICOMS system with the manifest data. And for us as a terminal, they share with us in a BAPLI format the position of the container on board his ship. Every ship has a 3D model with us, and basically, we know which box to discharge and which box stowed where for us on board that ship before the ship arrives. And then from there, the clearing agents start interacting with ACOMS, and then it goes through the customs process, etc., etc. All that is a digital process. To summarize, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the unmanned gate system, basically, all truck drivers, they are pre-registered. Whether he's coming to imp drop import or, or uh, sorry, to pick import or drop export, he has to go through the booking system, comes in, maybe this one speaks it better than the next one. Basically, as soon as he approaches the portal at the gate, his finger reads him. If he's a known person to come for an, an appointment, he's cleared in. Then basically, his car also is read, RFID, license plate recognition. Then he moves to scanner. He's scanned. The scanning in real time, the OCR, the optical character recognition, read the container number. Within seconds, it queries the customs database. ACOM says, I've got container number one, two, three. It says empty or it says it has a car. You know, scanner takes an image of it. It's empty, matches. Or if it's declared as a car, they will see a car. If it says empty and they find something, then basically they block it. From scanner, it goes to the OCR portal. This takes a high definition picture of the truck as well as the container top, sides, in the back. And reads the container number and tells the driver at the next gate where to go within the yard to pick or drop his container. And we have a sophisticated, massive gate complex to the entry of the terminal. Seizing opportunities. This is based on some data gathered to show where is our major import markets. And obviously China has got the darkest color, India, South Africa, Turkey, that's in Europe, America and Canada, obviously, due to a lot of Ghanaian expatriates living over there. Our export markets, again, India is taking the cashews, the timber, etc., etc. China as well taking some raw material, US, Europe taking the cocoa and the agro product. Then comes after. You know, we really never traded within our region, and this is the opportunity for the future. Some people were telling me, but uh, ECOWAS was there, didn't work. Yes, ECOWAS was there, it didn't work. But did we have internet when ECOWAS was launched? Did we have any digital penetration to trade? Can we, today on my phone, I can figure out where I can buy within a radius of a mile, two or 10,000, any product that I want. So things changed. What does it mean to us? after. Today we're creating the connectivity. It is important to have that connectivity to this market. The market is huge as you can see in the map. We have included here only the countries that we can imagine which are reachable. 
And this is quite a huge area. This block that you saw on the map represent a population. I mean, Nigeria alone is 200, you know. Represent a population just under half a billion. Just think about it. If each one wants to buy a pair of socks a year, that's half a billion pairs of socks. Multiply that with every consumer item that you can think of. The market is huge. And we really need to give it the focus that it deserves. Most of you represent industry. We built a port with a capacity that can take you for a hundred years. So you can build also on your own capacity to serve this market. Whether you're manufacturing a car or a plastic chair and whatever in between, the market is huge. On that note, I'm finishing. The GDP, as you can see, it's all up, up, up. And also, we are in a GDP in the range of, I don't know, 800 million heading towards a trillion. This is a lot of money, guys, to be grabbed, manufactured in Ghana, and even 10% of that, if we capture, is a huge issue. GDP per capita, you know, Nigeria might be the biggest economy, you know, and et cetera, we're next to it. We're the second largest economy for sure. But we are almost per capita, same as Nigeria. So we have even the potential to have a good market over itself, uh, over here for our industry. Few examples. This is PTP terminal, which was a fishing harbor a few years back. Look at it now. Morocco, Tangier, was built right in front of Al Jazeera in Africa. It's thriving terminal. Industry is building up in Morocco. Salala and Oman, the bottom desert side of Oman, thriving terminal. We are in the center of this world, Your Excellency. I'm pleased to tell you that today, MPS Tamaport is not only doing transshipment to Cotonou, Lagos, and Abidjan, and the interland countries. We're doing transshipment from China to Brazil, coming through Tema. The direct service, the big ships that we enabled by Terminal 3 is bringing cargo instead of sending it through the Pacific Ocean, through Panama Canal, pay high premiums to Brazil. They're bringing it on the regular service that calls Tema and the cross-Atlantic service pick from here and send it over there. Your Excellency, we're a hub between China and the Americas. We are a hub at the moment between South Africa and Europe. And thanks for the digitalization. We've got to unlock Africa. We have a huge potential. We're talking to some shipping lines to launch feedering service. Today, if you want to ship to Liberia, your container has to go to Europe and come back to Liberia. I hope very soon it won't be the case. And we will create the opportunity for shipping lines to set up shop over here. Thank you very much. Now, when Mr. Moses Baden challenges the governor of the Bank of Ghana to make sure that regulation is in tandem with innovation, I believe it's fair that he responds by speaking to us on resetting Ghana's economy, policy response, and strategies for building a resilient economy post-COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Maxwell Opukolafari. Your Excellency, Dr. Mahamud Baumia, the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, Honorable Ministers, Members of Parliament, Chairman of the Fifth CEO Summit, Captains of Industries and CEOs, the media distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is always a great pleasure to be part of this annual CEO Summit. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on the topical issue, resetting Ghana's economy, policy responses, and strategies for building a resilient economy post-COVID pandemic. 
a lot has been said about digitization, so I want to focus on policy so that we put the two together. We are all witnesses to the ravaging economic, health, and social effects of the COVID pandemic on the global economy. Indeed, as we speak, some countries are going through either a second or third wave with its associated human toll and continuous economic devastation. As a country, we have also gone through these challenges and the topic for discussion today is timely. Ladies and gentlemen, my remarks will start with two key questions. First, what was the state of Ghana's economy before COVID? Then second, what was the impact of COVID on the economy? Then we shift focus on strategies needed to reset the economy amid and post COVID pandemic. On the first part, what was the state of the Ghanaian economy before the pandemic? Your Excellency, implementation of sound macroeconomic policies between 2017 and 2019 significantly improved the macroeconomic fundamentals of the Ghanaian economy. Broadly, the economy was characterized by strong growth, averaging 7% over the period, and inflation declining to single digits and within the Bank of Ghana's medium-term target of 8 plus or minus 2%. Unwinding of the large macroeconomic imbalances resulted in lower fiscal and current account deficits, accompanied by three consecutive years of trade surpluses, the first time we've had that in over decades. The country's reserve buffers also improved, providing some anchor to exchange rate stability. Public debt policies were strengthened and the debt profile restructured to lessen the repayment burden. This created some fiscal space to support the implementation of growth enhancing policy initiatives by government. Alongside this, the Bank of Ghana implemented comprehensive financial sector reforms, which resulted in well-capitalized, strong and liquid banking sector, well-positioned to support the country's growth and transformation agenda. With this background, the policy direction at the start of 2020 was to further consolidate the achievements and move the country to the next stage of the development agenda. Consequently, prudent and complementary monetary and fiscal policies were programmed. First, monetary policy was to steer inflation further to low and stable levels. For the financial sector, the successful completion of the cleanup had improved prudential regulations, strengthened efficiency, and refocused the banking sector to its intermediary role to finance the growth needs of the country. Second, fiscal policy was geared towards aggressive tax reforms and pro-growth initiatives in the agriculture and industrial sectors to expand the productive capacity of the economy. And last but not the least, other structural reforms were initiated to increase efficiency of the public sector through digitization and by so doing, formalizing the economy and improving the ease of doing business. Then what was the impact of COVID on the economy? Ladies and gentlemen, this was where the Ghanaian economy was at the start of 2020, until March when the COVID pandemic disrupted the rather very strong economic outlook. The severity of the pandemic prompted restricted movements, lockdowns and border closures to halt its spread. This resulted in a slump in economic activity and almost wiped off the gains achieved over the last three years. For instance, GDP slowed down to 0.4% at the end of 2020, the lowest in decades, compared with pre-COVID projection of 6.8%. Inflation spiked from single digit to double digits, peaking at 11.4% in July 2020, driven mainly by food price pressures due to the lockdown measures before easing to 10.4% in December 2020. The disruptions in global supply chains adversely impacted trade activity. Businesses faced supply constraints amid weak consumer demand, which set off cost-cutting measures, including reduction in working hours, layoffs of workers, and wage cutbacks, worsening the unemployment situation in the country. Fiscal pressures from the health sector and the social consequences of the restricted movements mounted and disrupted the fiscal consolidation process. 
As a result, additional expenditures related to the COVID-19 coupled with revenue shortfalls on account of the economic slowdown and sharp drop in oil revenues elevated the 2020 fiscal deficit to 11.7% of GDP from the pre-COVID projection of 4.7% of GDP. These unanticipated fiscal developments also push up the stock of debt to 74.6% of GDP at the end of 2020 from 62.4% uh, of GDP recorded in 2029. Your Excellency, the combined demand and supply shocks from COVID required decisive and swift fiscal, monetary, and macroprudential policy responses to moderate economic damage. The policy responses included fiscal stimulus packages, including several social interventions. To complement this, the Bank of Ghana lowered the monetary policy rate by 150 basis points and implement, implemented other macroprudential measures to ensure adequate liquidity within the financial sector during the pandemic. The push for financial digitization was intensified with the removal of transfer costs for minimum transactions on mobile networks and the universal quick response code for payments across banks, telcos, fintechs, and merchants were implemented to promote e-commerce and e-transactions. Ladies and gentlemen, the economic costs of the COVID stock shock in the terms of foregone growth in its implication for employment and poverty reduction infrastructure development and economic expansion are enormous and will require carefully crafted strategies to reset the economy back to stability and growth. On resetting the economy during and post-COVID, Your Excellency, lessons drawn from other countries on building back better from the pandemic indicate that a flattened COVID curve is a necessary condition prior to massive rollout of policies and strategies designed to reset the economy. The reasoning being that subsequent COVID flare-ups could potentially slow the economic process. Based on this, the short-term strategies to reset Ghana's economy should be able to first sustain the flattened curve that we see in the country at the moment. By this, priority must be given to health sector policies and other supportive measures Tracing and treatment alongside mass vaccination rollouts should continue to achieve some form of herd immunity. The flattening curve will keep the economy open for business, provide some certainty to the economic outlook, and prevent diversion of resources to any resurgence of the pandemic. Second, we must maintain the COVID policy responses that we have introduced to sustain the ongoing V-shaped recovery. To a large extent, the COVID policy responses, that is accommodative fiscal and monetary policy, macroprudential measures, and other initiatives, have proved timely and helped moderate what could possibly have been a worse outcome for the Ghanaian economy. Already, the implementation of these policies have spared some recovery, recovery in the economy, evidenced by improvement in the bank's high-frequency economic indicators for the first quarter of 2021. Inflation has eased and declined back to single digits in April 2021, reaching 8.5%. The exchange rate remains stable. Business and consumer confidence have bounced back to pre-COVID levels. The bank's high-frequency indicators have also rebounded to near pre-pandemic levels. And also the banking sector remains strong with the support of the macroprudential measures and continues to play its intermediary role to boost growth post-COVID. Over time, Mr. Chairman and Your Excellency, the strategy should include innovative and actionable macroeconomic policies to unwind the COVID-related fiscal excesses and lower the public debt to sustainable levels. Broadly, we need prudent fiscal policies in place to be able to anchor the recovery. And thankfully, the 2021 budget has already reset fiscal policy on a consolidation path with a deficit projected to decline to 9.5% of GDP and unwind over the medium term to under 5% by 2024. 
This will ensure medium-term debt sustainability and achieve the set fiscal targets. Domestic revenue mobilization through tax reforms have to be stemmed up. And here, the ongoing national digitization program will be supportive. Already, the Ghana card and TIN numbers have been merged, broadening the tax base. Over time, this is expected to result in some revenue gains for the government. We also need to continue expenditure rationalization programs that are pro-growth and promote value-added uh, value-for-money projects along the line. There is also the need for complementary monetary policy and prudential measures to be able to sustain the recovery. Monetary policy and financial sector policies should be designed to anchor the disinflation process, create supportive frameworks for credit enhancement, digitization, and enhanced payment platforms to support growth. We also need effective implementation of pro-growth and that, in that case, the Ghana Cares Program remains a strong anchor for that. The socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic needs to be addressed, and the Ghana Cares Program is in the right direction. Among others, it seeks to stabilize, revitalize, and transform the economy to create jobs and prosperity over the next three years. We also need continued investment in the public health infrastructure over the medium term and to be able to ensure that we improve the country's preparedness to adequately handle future health crises. Digitization to improve the business environment is very critical. Pushing the boundaries for the economy-wide digitization through the measure of the national ID system or the Ghana card with other national databases to enhance transparency, facilitate seamless financial transactions, and reduce cost of doing business is very critical to the transformation and the recovery. In conclusion, Your Excellency, resetting the economy back to resilience will be a gradual process over the next two or three years and will require our collective and collaborative support and burden sharing to build back better. For the Bank of Ghana, we are committed to ensuring that the banking and other non-bank financial institutions remain resilient, inclusive, and supportive of resetting Ghana's post-COVID economy back to stability and growth. Thank you very much for your attention. And now, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to give to you the visionary behind this initiative, the CEO of the CEO's network, the convener of the fifth Ghana CEO Summit, yours and mine, Ernest Degraft Eji. On behalf of the Chief Executives Network of Ghana, I want to express our special appreciation to His Excellency, the President of Ghana, and the Vice President of Ghana. Anytime we have extended invitation to them, they have always joined us here. Can we give it to them? Some of the speeches they have given us leads to some calls of action that today I will want to mention. We have the SDG Advisory Office. Captains of industry are encouraged to liaise with the office to sustain the SDG Development Fund. In 2016, the Ghana CEO Summit was established and we have led the digitalization agenda of this country to help the government shape policies in that order. Our call to action this year is that government looks at establishing a Digital Economy Act to help with the many initiatives that you have proffered. Your Excellency, the Vice President of Ghana, Chiefs and Captains of Industry, Distinguished guests, this summit comes at a pivotal time in our lives and in the life of corporate Ghana. This era has become defining in the annals of world commerce and has shaken the foundations of established order. The summit is therefore coming at a time like no other. The fact that we have 
had to suspend the summit for one year due to the pandemic speaks to the peculiarity of the moment. I am delighted, however, that this event comes to show that progress, even if slowly, is being made against the virus and corporate Ghana is rising again. For indeed, it is a truism that many stories of success and glory are born of the ashes of tragedies. This pandemic and the daunting prospects it held for business and industry challenges all of us to look at things anew. With the right spirits and attitude to a changing world. Changing times, fast tracked by necessity and the difficulties of our time. Your Excellency, the experience of the last year and a half showed that subjects that had been on the slow burner, which had been discussed with the luxury of patience, can no longer be treated as such. If the theme of the summits has been focused on digital transformation, then it is because the pandemic has taught us a painful lesson of a new reality. A reality in which the gradual migration of the world from conventional orthodoxies in the way business is done has now become instant and complete. The truth is that physical office meetings have now become obsolete. Presence in business meetings and transactions have been redefined. Hiring a location of work has become utterly malleable and borders have all but vanished. We have suddenly woken up to the reality of a world in which the internet, once a luxury of the big dreamer, has now become the oxygen of business. We have become subject to the certainty of a new world marked and defined by safety in which the physical workspace has become the very essence of risk. Ensuring the digital transformation of, the corporate, of corporate Ghana and the overall infrastructural and regulatory space of doing business will determine the extent of progress in the corporate and economic space of Ghana moving on in the post-pandemic phase of our world. Yet, are we ready? Are we aligned with the needs of this world and the factors of change introduced by this new reality? Are we prepared to make the needed investments for the transformative agenda which is upon us? In this new reality, the truth is there will be losers and gainers. Old player may or must give way to new one. Values must and should change the heedless profiteering. That cannot be the main or the sole clarion call of companies leading the charge. In this new world, government may have to make some hard choices and strong leadership may be called, may be called for in order to ensure that the social goods of the internet age is delivered. The hard issues have to be dealt with, and the approach with, which, with the zeal of people confronted by the real risk of disaster if nothing is done. This summit is a call for that kind of conversation and a charge for concrete policy interventions in order for corporate Ghana to be saved from the seemingly permanent scourges imposed by the pandemic. The choice of the theme, Your Excellency, is informed by the reality of the moment. But it also reflects ongoing government agenda at digital transformation, a tribute to the visionary foresight of your government. But as mentioned, the subject has now grown in form and complexity and can no longer be pursued in piecemeal and placed on the pedestal of incrementalism. The subject of digital transformation now demands stakeholder inputs and a comprehensive 
policy blueprint that incorporates the various facets of business, human rights, economy, and planning in general. The theme was chosen to re-emphasize the need to build a future of corporate Ghana around the foundations of digital transformation in the order of things. For the simple truth is that the world is moving into that phase and with the advent of Internet of Things and AI technology, Ghanaian businesses must inevitably adapt or die. And given that the latter option cannot be contemplated, there's a need for all players to come to the table with a sense of knowledge and purpose. Hence the team. Therefore, at the end of this summit, a community reflecting the broad consensus arrived at will be issued and it's our hope that your excellency that this will feed into policy as you lead and drive the agenda on digital transformation of government. The panels have been structured to reflect the complex adversity of the issues raised. Given that this is the fifth in the series of the summit a panel will review the contribution and impact of the CEO summit to shaping the narrative and the development of corporate Ghana since its inception. This panel will provide the requisite background context for the summit and help forge appropriate conversations in the common action plan of CEOs and companies in Ghana, especially during this pandemic. Another panel will look at the vexed question of doing business in Ghana and how the environment, the business and regulatory environment can be improved. This panel will review in the minimum the structural and systemic obstacles impinging on our impacting doing business in Ghana and will evaluate the issues from the perspective of standard metrics and international instruments including the World Bank ease of doing business, business country assessment and others. Finally, the panel on forging public-private dialogues will review the need of sustained dialogues between the private and public sectors. Building these synergies remain crucial, given that the distinction between the two are in many instances artificial in the light of the many interfaces that exist between them. This panel will look at the need for synergy, adoption and implementation policies and recommendations coming out of these panels. I would like to welcome everyone to this summit and I look forward to the most productive deliberations among us in the next two days. On this note, I'd like to welcome you all to the Fit Ghana CEOs. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, NSD Graft Ejiri, CEO of the CEOs Network and convener of the Ghana CEO Summit. Thank you for your warm note of welcome. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the moment we've all been waiting for Please welcome the Dean of the UPSA Law School, the Managing Partner of Access Legal, and the Chair of the CU Network Ghana, Lawyer Ernest Kofi Abuchi. Vice President, Captains of Industry, Ministers of State, and members of the Diplomatic Corps, the Vice President is a friend of this summit who has, as indicated earlier, always responded positively when invited. Few people have the commitment and passion and the marching office and authority to speak to the theme of the summit than the Vice President. And it is therefore in light of that that I request respectfully that we all rise to welcome our guest of honor, the special guest of honor, His Excellency the Vice President of the Republic. Ministers of State, members of Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, CEOs and Captains of Industry, distinguished invited guests, Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by expressing my profound gratitude 
to the Chief Executives Network Ghana Limited for organizing this fifth CEO Summit in partnership with Deloitte, the GIPC, and the State Interest and Governance Authority, SIGA. I wish to also thank the organizers for extending an invitation to me to deliver the keynote speech on the theme, Digital Transformation, Powering Business and Government Reset for a Post-Pandemic Economic Resilience, a Private Sector Dialogue. Indeed, the organizers could not have chosen a more suitable theme for this summit for this year, 2021. Putting the spotlight on how digital transformation can unlock Ghana's economic potential in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic is a worthy conversation to have now. Let me further express my appreciation to the Chief in the Executives Network Ghana Limited and other sponsors for organizing this annual event for the past six years with the objective of continuing to provide a platform to give business leaders and policy makers the opportunity to engage on issues affecting businesses and the economy in the age of digital transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, building a resilient economy has been the focus of Nana Adodankwa Kufuado's government since January 2017, when we first came into office. When we came into office, we immediately set ourselves to work. In the area of technology, I invited a number of companies, uh, inc including fintechs and startup to startups to join me to Silicon Valley. We engaged a number of IT solutions companies, experimenting with innovative ideas, doing research into different areas of applications from agriculture to medicine, in the delivery of financial services, and in machine learning or artificial intelligence. On our return, I invited these companies back to the Jubilee House and charged them to help provide solutions to our development bottlenecks and promised them our fullest support in any area of application, especially in three areas, how to improve the business environment, how to address government administrative bottlenecks in service delivery to households and to the business sectors, and how to formalize the economy. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic raged the world and severely affected all aspects of our lives. The pandemic undoubtedly affected businesses and economies globally, leading to immeasurable losses in various sectors. Key drivers of the economic growth, key drivers of economic growth suffered. Business slowdown and disruptions in global supply chains and trade threatened financial markets and the financial system as a whole. The reverse multiplier effects and the imperatives to save lives put public finances at risk. Many governments prioritized lives over the economy. Soon, not only were we confronted with the challenge of social disruptions, but also the challenge of saving the economy so that we can continue to provide needed savings to households and businesses. A large number of businesses were forced to shut down totally and others had to operate significantly reduced capacities. Ghanaian businesses were also significantly affected in diverse ways, creating high levels of uncertainty and a plunge in business confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, the world in the year 2021 continues to live in uncertain times and moving in uncertain directions. COVID-19 continues to put public health at risk. Nimbly, Ghana has made a combination of social and economic interventions and policy choices on many fronts. 
What Ghana has done and continues to do square well with the way advanced economies are carrying out the fight against the pandemic. And in some cases, we are doing even better. We continue to deploy an array of social economic interventions, temporarily lowering the bar on fiscal prudence, and continue to revise policy choices and interventions as needed. The central bank ably is doing its part, lowering interest rates, easing, li easing liquidity, mindful not to ignite inflation more than the economy can handle and what, more than what people expect with the expectations that the pandemic will wane soon, the Ghana Cares program laid out a set of policy pathways and instruments to stabilize the economy and stimulate recovery in the shortest possible time. Ladies and gentlemen, what is left is how the private sector would respond to the policy innovations and interventions which government has put together. We will continue with our comprehensive efforts to save lives, safeguard the educational system, minimize interruptions in the educational system, ensure micro, small, medium, and large enterprises continue to thrive and continue to fuel the economy even as the pandemic persists. It is in the middle of all these challenges that we must continue to re-examine our ways and means of doing things from home to the office, from the farm to the factory, between government and citizens and businesses and vice versa. We must continue to challenge ourselves on how to deliver learning services, our conventional notion of the classroom, and how to deliver and manage our health system. It is absolutely imperative to reset and reignite business and the economy in these times to ensure continuous growth and development of the Ghanaian economy. The pandemic has presented a much needed opportunity which we can, with which we can reset the economy while still building upon the solid foundation laid before 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated ample systematic flaws in the way we do things including the way we conduct business, thereby requiring us to rethink and reorient ourselves and our businesses. We cannot succeed if we hold on to the old ways of doing things. If we want to survive, we will have to dwell on the lessons learned from the pandemic going forward. Our government continues to take steps to sanitize the regulatory environment for the conduct of business in Ghana. Our efforts at digitization, by working towards a cash light economy, providing a framework for electronic incorporation and regulation of business entities under the New Companies Act and e-procurement, to mention a few, are all aimed at making it easier to conduct business in Ghana. I appreciate the fact that we can do more, and this is in, in this regard, I wish to extend a warm invitation to the business community to engage us on measures they will want the government to put in place to make it easier for them to do business. It is essential to mention that in our bid to reset business and the economy, digitization has an enormous role to play. One of the lessons of the pandemic, one of the lessons the pandemic has taught us is that digitization is the future, a future that perhaps started yesterday. Businesses will, by necessity, have to integrate appropriate digital technologies in their operations and service delivery in order to increase productivity and output. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest issues that has confronted our economy and many African economies has been the highly informal nature, along with the manual, bureaucratic, and cumbersome processes involved in the delivery of government services. All of that increases the cost of doing business. 
we had a situation where over 90 percent of the population had no unique identity there was no working address system over 70 percent of eligible of the eligible population had no bank accounts most transactions were cash based and less than 10 percent of the population had tax identification numbers. Clearing goods at the port was a nightmare. Obtaining driver's licenses, passports, or renewing your NHRS card were very problematic. Purchasing electricity units for your meter was a problem. Birth certificates and, and manual, obtaining birth certificates and manual court processes and so on were inefficient and costly. And so this situation resulted in a difficulty in solving crimes, in higher interest rates at banks, delays in obtaining government services, lower government revenue, and so on. While this set of facts has long been recognized, no government had taken a systematic and concerted effort to address it. We just, over the years, lived with the problem rather than try to solve it. At the time, after I left the Bank of Ghana in uh, 2009, beginning of 2009, of course, having just lost an election, I left the Bank of Ghana and then went out as a visiting scholar to Oxford University where I wrote a book on monetary policy and financial sector reform in Africa. That period gave me a, a lot of time for reflection on what we had done since independence and the book chronicles monetary policy and economic policy from independence uh, through to 2008 basically. And I looked at the effectiveness of all that we were doing, particularly the question that kept you know, coming back to mind was what are we doing, how come the interest rates that we want to, to decline are not declining? Uh, for the most part, monetary policy would bring down the monetary policy rate, will bring down the interest rates, but Lending rates remain stubbornly high, you know, and you, one needed to really get to the bottom of this. Why are all these inefficient processes in the bureaucracy and so on taking place? It became obvious as I reached at the conclusion of that book that the macro, just getting the macro economy right was not sufficient. Getting inflation down was not sufficient. Getting exchange rates stable was not sufficient. There were certain micro foundations or systems that need to be in place for our economy to be able to deliver the low interest rates that will drive um, business and economic activity. But for the longest time, as we interacted with the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, you realize that nobody is going to come and tell you that these micro foundations, you have to put them in place. Nobody would tell you that if you don't put in a digital address system, uh, we will not give you a loan. Or if you don't have a national ID, we'll make it a condition. You know, so there were all these things which I refer to as the unwritten rules of the game. Because if you are in a game, you must understand the rules. If you don't understand the rules and you are playing, uh, you will keep losing the game. But some of these rules are not written in our economic textbooks. They are unwritten rules. But you know that if you are an economy and you don't have a working address system, you are not going to go very far. If you cannot uniquely identify the population in your country, you are not going to go very far as an economy. You can have exchange rate stability and lower fiscal deficits and so on, but you are going to be just operating in a low-level equilibrium. You will not move up to a higher level. 
and moving up to the higher level is what we want to do. Now, if you look at the trajectory, therefore, that we decided to take, we, the government of Nana Dudangwa Kufuado, made the strategic decision to address these chronic problems by digitizing the Ghanaian economy and government services. The overarching objective of this digital drive is to formalize the economy, increase government revenue, fight corruption, and ultimately provide public services to, to citizens more efficiently and more conveniently. Digitization essentially removes the human interface. And if you look at the problems we had, whether it's at the passport office, or the driver's license office, or the ports, or the births and deaths registry, uh, or the Ghana uh, uh, GRE Revenue Authority, all these interfaces, all the problems we were having in these different areas was because of the human interface. And as they say, nipa ye bad. The human interface, uh, you will encounter corruption immediately because the systems were very uh, bureaucratic and manual. And so we decided to digitize. And so we needed to put certain pillars in place. Issue national ID cards to all Ghanaians, implement a functional address system, provide de facto bank accounts to the bankable, uh, to the, those people who are eligible for bank accounts, implement mobile money interoperability, digitize the provision of government services, and so on. We are, I'm very happy to note that we've made tremendous progress on all these fronts, and Ghana is clearly on its way to become one of the most digitized economies in Africa within the next two years. Specifically, we've issued the National Biometric ID Card, which no government has been able to do since independence. So far, we have 15.5 million people who have been enrolled, and we expect that this process for the above 15 years uh, democratic, demographic, that those above 15 years of age, that process will be completed this year. Uh, we will then move into the schools and do those below 15 years of age. But this national ID system that has been implemented has provided Ghana a database that will be the anchor for all transactions in the future. We are about to move into a new economy, if you, don't, if you haven't already realized that. Uh, it, because it is going to provide a unique, a single source of truth and a unique identity um, for all transactions across the spe spectrum. And so this year, what we've been doing since we came into office has been the integration of the National ID database with other databases, key databases. So we've integrated it with SNPT, we've integrated it with GRA, and with GRA, for example, up to 2016, TIN numbers in Ghana were 750,000. By just making the TIN number your national ID number, we've immediately increased it from 750,000 in 2016 to 15.5 million as of now in terms of people with tax ID numbers. We have, we, have, we have integrated the national ID with the NHIS, and uh, we, are, we are moving on to controlling an accountant general's department. Uh, the ghost workers will not be happy, um, but we are doing that now. We are, we, are, we are in discussions with the banks and the Bank of Ghana, and Bank of Ghana is driving. Uh, all bank accounts uh, will be linked to a national ID number and the process will, will, will start soon, and banks will start, once the process starts, they will start accepting and verifying the individuals using the national ID card. Um, I, I expect, as the uh, Minister for Communications and Dig Digitalization, uh, we'll soon announce which, the, that we will all, from maybe end of June or beginning of July this year, 
everybody will have to register their SIM with a national ID number. So we all have to do that, otherwise we lose that SIM. Uh, and that will really give us uh, a real um, identity for all Momo transactions, for example. And it then takes away fraud that is taking place, whether it's SIM box or through Momo and so on. We will, we will discard all of that. Um, we will also, um, we are moving, we are dis also doing the births and deaths registry. The digitization there is about 80% complete now. Uh, but what we are putting in place with the births and deaths registry is a system where we hope uh, from next year, when a child is born, right at birth, within a month, each child will be given a unique national ID number across the country. And that will help us maintain that database right from birth all the way to death. So it's um, really a, a different country that we are trying to, to move into. Uh, I know that it was a challenge. What we, tried to, what we have done in Ghana uh, was a challenge. When we met with the NIA and the margins group, initially they had wanted to issue very, very delayed cards because it was, uh, but we said that they, they, given the nature of our people, you should do instant issuance of these cards because a lot of the times if people have cards, they may not return for them. And we should try to do instant issuance. But they pointed us out that no country in the world had done instant issuance of national ID cards before. So we said, well, we will be the first. And we were the first. So thank you very much for, for, for for, for making us happen, making that happen. We've implemented a digital address system capturing every square inch of land or water in Ghana. In the process of implementing the digital address system, we have provided unique addresses for 7.5 million properties in Ghana. We have identified 7.5 million, including huts in all the villages, 7.5 million properties, and we are providing digital addresses and street addresses to all those um, houses and properties. The Land Use and Spatial Planning Authority has provided street names and house numbers for every unnamed street, and we are affixing address plates for every property, uh, and we'll continue to do that. There are 7.5 million. The first phase will deal with 4 million properties, and the next phase will deal with 3.5 million properties. We've already begun discussions and they are going very well with Google and they, and if all goes well, they will incorporate Ghana's property address system into Google Maps and we will move from there. This is the first time since independence that Ghana will have a complete property address system. And for businesses, uh, nobody really needs to tell you the implications, the impact of having a, a unique property addressing system in, in the country. You just think about it, whether it's America or the UK or Germany, if today the address systems disappear, just the address systems, those economies will collapse, just like that. They cannot function without address systems. And so we are, the opportunity cost of not having a, these address systems for e-commerce and so on is just huge. Delivery of services and so on is huge. And we are really um, very, very, very um, happy that Ghana has been able to do this. Of course, there is the groundbreaking mobile money interoperability, which has also been implemented. Uh, the mobile money payments interoperability has made it easy for transfer of money across different telcos and between bank accounts and mobile wallets. That is the unique feature of Ghana's interoperability. You're not just going between different telcos, but between bank accounts and mobile wallets. And since you have over, you know, so much in, 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 in the system, it has solved the major problem of people having access to bank accounts because more through, because of mobile money interoperability, bank accounts uh, or mobile money accounts are essentially functioning like bank accounts. The data shows that the Ghana currently is the fastest growing mobile money market in Africa. And the total value of mobile money transactions in 2020 during this pandemic 
was 569 billion Ghana CDs. That's about a hundred billion dollars in 2020. It's, it's just mind boggling, right? Mobile money transactions in one year because of interoperability have reached a hundred billion dollars in Ghana. Now, checks on the other hand amounted to 180 billion instead of the 569 billion for mobile money. So checks are slowly, uh, of course, I, I, I think it wouldn't be long, Gov Deputy Governor, uh, I, I, I think checks will soon be history <laughs> uh, as, we, as we go on. But, but when you think about it, we invested $4.5 million to set up mobile money interoperability. For just $4.5 million. And it's generating transaction of about $100 billion. So you, you, you see the, 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 the impact of, of that and, and on why this soft infrastructure can have far-reaching economic implications. You, you know, you could have built um, an interchange, for example, for $50 million. But the impact on the economy would be much, much less when you look at this uh, happening. So we are, we are looking at, at this. We've also brought in the universal QR code, um, which is also unique in its own way um, to reduce the dominance of cash in the economy. We needed a system which would bring in everybody. The point of sale devices that banks have are not accessible to your watches sellers or the trotro or operators or your um, tomato sellers in the market or Kobe sellers. They, those, you know, systems, the, the point of sale devices are too expensive. And but if these are where a large volume of transactions are taking place. So if you want to go into a cashless or cash light economy, you must have a system that in, uh, allows electronic use, usage of these systems by every merchant, every merchant. And this is why we thought that we should leverage on our mobile money interoperability, which everybody uses mobile money, bank accounts and so on, and bring in a universal QR code um, which is available to every merchant. Uh, shoeshine boys can have their QR codes, and the QR codes are basically free to, to, to have. So everybody can have a QR code. Uh, even beggars can obtain their QR code in case you don't have cash on you. They can, <laughs> the beggar can give you their QR code, and then you can give you, give you, send them cash. <laughs> we are catering for, catering for everybody. Uh, nobody will be left behind. Even the YAM phones uh, can, can be very, you know, you can use a USSD code for the YAM phone. So you, it doesn't have to be a smartphone. But we are about to really roll this out in a big way. And it will really reduce a lot of cash transactions. And for a lot of businesses, keeping cash is a big risk with arm robberies, even traders traveling with cash, but with a QR code, universal QR code, anybody with a mobile money account or uh, a bank account can use, can use it, and the fintechs are doing their own um, QRs and so on. We, 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 are, we are encouraging that, you know, we move in this direction for, for, for people uh, in, to, to, to get used to it and, and for cash to, to be reduced in our, but then you will have a lot more efficiency in the system. So today the outcomes from our digitization drive are paying off. These initiatives are aimed at digitizing all sectors of the Ghanaian economy to ensure efficiency and ultimately achieve digital transformation. For businesses, a digital economy translates into conducive environment, into a conducive environment for conducting businesses and for increasing profits. This year, we are going to be big in the land registry. This has been one area where we need to really complete the digitization process of the land registry, because land is really a major bottleneck 
in terms of business development and uh, so much capital is locked up, you don't know who owns it, transferring it becomes a problem and so we need transparency and, and so we, we are doing that. Digitization of the hospitals is taking place, the senior high schools, there's a whole gamut. Um, at, at least 90% of the senior high schools now uh, are supposed to be covered. I hope they are all covered and I think they are by free Wi-Fi now and we are going to continue uh, to, to, to doing that. You know, to all chief executives and business leaders gathered here today, I encourage you all to diligently enhance your operations with innovative digital technology and to drive business evolution for, and for survival. Also, notions of sustainability and long-term value max maximization must be at the core of the governance and operations of businesses. Businesses need to recognize and appreciate the contribution of social and environmental factors and interactions on their operations and output. To adequately prepare for the unpredictable occurrences such as COVID-19, we should focus on building sustainable businesses and an economy that will remain resilient even in the face of the crisis. The pandemic has taught us that businesses are intimately connected with society and such intimate connection will require businesses to be responsive to the needs of all stakeholders. The attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals as well as Agenda 2063 is an aspiration we must all continue to collaborate and work towards in our quest to reset the economy and businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. We must remain committed to achieving these goals. I will take this opportunity to charge all decision makers of businesses gathered here today to take advantage of this summit to forge key partnerships that will constitute a formidable force in our bid to reset businesses and the economy. The fight is against a common enemy and not against each other. The exchange of ideas and resources is cardinal if we are to emerge victorious from the negative conditions created by the pandemic. Addressing the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic also requires that we vaccinate as many people as possible against the virus in order to revitalize safe economic activity that will grow our economy. We vaccinated close to a million people uh, and we will do more subject to obtaining more vaccines. Our vaccination quest is a glaring testament of government's commitment to getting the economy back on track. And government will strive to ensure that a majority of Ghanaians are vac vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity. We've now However, decided to digitize the vaccination card, which you will receive when you get vaccinated, um, so that the card is now being embossed with a QR code, so that wherever you go in the world, when they digitally check your vaccination, they will see that indeed you have had one vaccination or two vaccinations, uh, and therefore it cannot be altered and this is the, the advantage of it so that we become part uh, of the global citizenry. Uh, and, and I think that that would be good for, for Ghana. I wish you all the very best in your deliberations and we look forward to the outcome of your deliberations. And I thank you for your attention. God bless us and God bless our homeland Ghana. Thank you very much. And in time held tradition of this house, we shall invite you, the Vice President, for a brief moment of interactions with our moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. So this segment is a short one, but it's an opportunity for us to have an intimate conversation in light of the things that you raised. So let's just get to it very quickly. You touched on a number of things, and indeed before the pandemic hit, everybody knew you were a crusader for the digital economy. And for some years, I'm sure it sounded a bit uh, much of a luxurious conversation. The digital is out there. Then the pandemic hit and the reality um, came home. We all know today that the digital space is no more an alternative. It is a necessity. 
The question is, are you happy, in light of all the things that you said, are you happy with the state of the rollout of the digital economy? And if you're not, where do we move from here? Well, thank you very much. Um, I must say, one of the important uh, and aspects of Ghana's digitization is that we have done it with the private sector. If you look at everything that we have done, National ID, an indigenous Ghanaian firm, leading the process, margins, digital address, another indigenous Ghanaian firm, the Bank of Ghana through Gibbs is driving interoperability. So it has been a very collaborative effort uh, that we have had between government and the private sector um, hospital digitalization, all of that is going on through the private sector. And so we have, if you look at what we have done, getting back to your question, I think um, we've set, we set targets for what we wanted to do. And so far, I think I'm reasonably happy. I am a hard task master when it comes to some of these deliverables. But if you look at what Ghana has done, just in a space of four years, it has been quite remarkable what Ghana has been able to do, what we as a country, the private sector, the public sector, what we have collaboratively been able to do in just four years. It is, it's remarkable. We, we've played with this national ID card for, for so long. It was never happening. We now have it. A digital address is now a reality. Mobile money interoperability, we've done it for very low cost. The port system, we've digitized the processes, as you saw with the MPS presentation. Um, the hospitals are being digitized, we are moving on to schools. So I, am, I want to, of course, see a faster uh, digitization process, and you know, this is what we've been pushing for. But in terms of what we've been able to achieve so far, I think Ghana can be proud of itself. Uh, we are the pace setters here in Africa. We are. As you drive from the city to the countryside, I think the, div the digital divide becomes clear. And the cities are crying in particular, probably okay. But as you go to the countryside, for businesses that are spread across the country, in other words, businesses which have branches in the villages and in the countryside, hmm. This di digital divide may become deeper if they depend on the internet and ICT space. Again, ICT companies have been criticized for not investing enough in infrastructure. So is there a plan, probably underway, to incentivize these companies to invest in infrastructure to ensure that coverage is absolute? Yes, um, Prof. I think that your, the point is very well made. Um, if you look at it, there is a clear digital divide in that sense between the rural areas and the more remote parts of our country and the urban areas. And so we need to improve our investment in infrastructure. And if you look at the work that uh, the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization is trying to do, this is a clear objective of, 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 of the ministry to bridge that digital divide. And we're encouraging the private sector also uh, to move in that direction. So we want to definitely do so. Otherwise, you know, we will have problems in, in achieving the, the full impact of digitization. Right. Closely related to this is the issue of data. Again, until the pandemic hit, you know, some people were surviving pretty much without the internet and digital stuff. Now the digital economy, the digital space is an inescapable reality. So data has become, in some circles, a human rights situation. <laughs> some research has indicated that the average household spends about $2 on a one gigabyte you know, control data, which has been estimated to be pretty high. So even though Ghana is doing well ahead of its West African neighbors, the question is, are, we, are there plans? To, you know, come down on the cost of data. Yes, I think that you, you've touched again on a very important point, and this is why in the last budget, the cost of data was reduced, as, as you know. 
it is a major, we are doing well in West Africa. Uh, th there's no doubt about that. Uh, and so we have to look at that, that in, in, in perspective. Um, this is also why, for example, we are trying to provide free Wi-Fi in the universities and also in the senior high schools. The project has gone pretty far, over almost 90% of senior high schools are now covered across the country so that people who would not have normally be able to afford data at current prices will have the opportunity to access. If we can get our schools done, we want to do all libraries. We have about 86 libraries, public libraries in the country. Uh, so far, the 16 in Accra have free Wi-Fi currently as we speak. And we want to roll that out to the rest of the, the country. Um, we are now just having discussions for Wi-Fi to the police stations as well, uh, and all of that. And those will all be accessible. But I think that you know, the, the issue of bringing down further the cost of data, this is what you are saying. Ideally, you would want it free, right? Well, <laughs> <good> <laughs> uh, but we have to balance the interest of, of uh, revenue generation on the one hand with, with also moving uh, these forward. Yeah. In your presentation, you mentioned the fact that you're trying to remove the human interfaces to avoid the prospects of corruption and all these challenges of humans you know, being in the mix of things. But you would also agree that as you remove the human interface, then the unemployment situation comes in as machines and you know, the automated systems kick in. Question is, are we, do we have plans to contain the, 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 the fallout of the, of the digital economy which deals a lot with the non-human part of things and therefore the unemployment situation which is already acute. That's the first part respectfully. The second part, sorry about that. I said questions so sometimes I have a problem with questions. The second part respectfully is do we have plans of skills training that is consistent with the digital economy? Blockchain technology is out there but you hardly hear of it here. And as someone in academia, it's a bit of a shame to us. Um, the AI environment is going to create the same unemployment thing that I mentioned. So as you tie that in with the first question, I'll be happy if we can address the unemployment situation together with the skills training. That is a, that's again another important issue. But if you look at where we are and how we are trying to use this digitization to deal with this economy, in fact, the current systems we believe are costing this economy so much the theft that was taking place at the port because of manual systems. The savings government can make by digitizing can be invested in so many different areas to create more jobs, to move, you know, to agriculture, industry, and so on, infrastructure. You know, so there are many, many you look at what we've been doing recently, the last four years, through bunkering and illegal activities, government has lost tax revenue of about 4.7 billion Ghana cities. We have decided to digitize the fuel retail system, which we just rolled out. Now, if you save a billion cities a year in revenue by that digitization process alone, what can you use to do it? Look at what we've done with drones. The remote areas of Ghana could not access critical medicines and blood supplies and vaccines, right? We've brought in zipline. The drone services have started. This has created jobs. All these drone centers, we have four now. By the end of this year, we'll have another four, which will cover the whole of Ghana. These drone services are 100% manned by Ghanaian flight engineers, 100%. This is jobs that it is creating. The last week I heard that they have come to Ghana to get a few to go to Nigeria to help set up a few Ghanaians to go. We are now going to be exporting that skill in, the, in that sense. So technology 
historically, whenever new technology comes in, there's always a fear. You know, you saw that in the Industrial Revolution, and there's always a fear about how is it going to impact on jobs. But we are in a much better situation in our stage of development than, say, a Germany or a US or a UK. They're in a very different stage. We still have major expansions to do in various parts of our economy. And we believe that if we bring in the technology in those areas, you will have more jobs, ultimately. Uh, I, I, you're not going to get many robots take over production in Ghana tomorrow. It will take, it will take some time all right, before we get there. But we can really see opportunities in many different sectors where technology, whether it's in agriculture or industry, or where technology can expand job opportunities, new, I mean, entrepreneurs, because of the availability of technology, will set up new businesses that they were not able to even think about five years ago. The, the new opportunities are coming up. Jobs, digital address system, someone has written an application, they are employing people. We have some of the skilled people. Now, of course, you have to tailor your skills development to what is emerging, and, and, and you see that we are going to try to do exactly that, the skills development program to be able, but we have very, very talented kids in, 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 in the technology space, very talented. Would have wished to ask many more questions, but this is the Vice President, whose time is very limited. Kindly please appreciate the answers. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the Republic, His Excellency Alhaji Dr. Mahamadou Baumia. This afternoon, Mr. Vice President, it is fit and proper that we recognize, celebrate, and profile the achievements of business and corporate leaders for their business successes, innovation, leadership, and overall contribution to the economy via this platform we initiated six years ago. Three award categories are up for grabs, the CEO Excellence Awards for the CEO of the Decade, CEO Excellence Award for CEO of the Year, and CEO Excellence Award to those of our CEOs who have gracefully made it into the Hall of Fame category. For the next few minutes, Mr. Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to do us the honors, the South African High Commissioner to Ghana, Her Excellency Grace Janet Mark Mason, in the company of the CEO of the CEO's network, NSD Graftedry, and the Chair of the Board, Loya Kofi Abuchi. And the first set will be for the CEO of the decade. And so the first CEO who has made it to be celebrated CEO of the decade is from the print sector, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Type Company Limited, Mr. Kobe Asma. And there he comes, ladies and gentlemen. We join the steps. We celebrate you for all that you've achieved. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from the shipping sector, the chairman, Magdan Group, Dr. Daniel McCauley. He's presented to an individual. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> Environmental and sanitation sector, ladies and gentlemen, CEO of the decade, the CEO of the Jospon Group, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joseph Sian Ajepon. And the award will be received on his behalf. From the pharmaceutical sector, CEO of the decade, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Ernest Chemist, Dr. Ernest Bediako Sampong. Congratulations. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Rubber and Plastics, the CEO of the decade, the CEO of Interplast, Haysam Fakri. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, from Media, the CEO of the decade, the CEO of the Multimedia Group, Mr. Kwesi Shum. Let's now move to the beverage manufacturing industry, ladies and gentlemen. The CEO of the decade, Blow Group, Bell Aqua, Manoj Lakiani. Okay, we shall skip Manoj and go to 
the metal and building manufacturing sector, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of B5 Plus Group, Mukesh Makwani. For building the biggest steel manufacturing plant in West Africa, we say congratulations to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Information and Communications Technology CEO of the Decade, the CEO of the Margins Group, is the most hidden junior. Hospitality and the CEO of Kwale's group wins the CEO of the decade, Nana Kwame Bidiako. A voice of freedom. Airlines and aviation, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the decade, CEO of the Delta Airlines, Mr. Paco Shum. Automobile and the CEO of the decade is the CEO of Japan Motors, Salem Kalmoni. For electrical and manufacturing, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Tropical Cables and Conductors, Mr. Tony Oting JC. Doctor, I beg your pardon. All right. The petroleum sector and the CEO of the is the founder and executive chairman of the Allied Oil Ghana Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dan Okujato. Okay, congratulations. The last two awards are for the CEO of the Decade Male Category. And ladies and gentlemen, it goes to the CEO of Imperial Homes, Mr. Francis Baini. Congratulations to him wherever he is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Woman CEO of the Decade, the CEO of Clifton Homes, Madam Anne Browin. And so, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Her Excellency, Madam Grace Janet Masson. Thank you very much for doing us the honors. I shall now invite to join our CEO together with the chair of the board, the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Maxwell Okokwafari. Mr. Vice President, the next set of awards is in respect of the CEO of the year. We shall begin with the first from the FinTech Category. Ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of ZPay, Mr. Andrew Tichi Apia. <laughs> oil and marketing, oil marketing companies, ladies and gentlemen, in the category, CEO of Vivo Energy, Mr. Ben Hassan Watara. And we say congratulations for your leadership and all the sustain, sustainability efforts around Ghana through your company. For airlines, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the year, the CEO of Air France, KLM, Mr. Dick Van Nieuwenhuizen. Say so congratulations. And now, ladies and gentlemen, energy and power, the CEO of VRA, Mr. Emmanuel Enchi Dakwa. Oil and gas, and ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of GNPC, Dr. K.K. Sapong. In the food sector, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of D United Foods Industries Limited, Mahesh Shah. And if you enjoy Indomie, please, another round of applause. Congratulations to you, sir. Let's go to banking and ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the year, CEO of Standard Chartered Bank, Madame Mansa Nete. Ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the year, Agro Business, Ecom Ghana, Muhammadu Muzalmil. Round of applause. In the retail space, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the year, the CEO of CompuGhana, Said Masri. <laughs> ladies and 
Ladies and gentlemen in the telecommunications sector, the CEO of the year, MTN Ghana, Salom Adadevo. The award will be received on his behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, the young CEO of the year is the CEO of Santol Energy, Alhaji Farid. I mean, Yakubu. Let's go now to the multinational CEO of the year in the business leadership category. Ladies and gentlemen, the managing director, West and Central Africa, Equatorial Coca-Cola Bottling Company Limited, Felix Gomez. And finally, the CEO of the year in the public sector, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Mr. Yofi Grant. The award will be received on his behalf. Business excellence. The award celebrates. All right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the first deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, a round of applause. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, ladies and gentlemen our CEOs who have gracefully made it into the Hall of Fame category. It's my pleasure to invite our guest of honor, the Vice President of the Republic, to present these honors. A round of applause as he comes. Your Excellency, we shall begin with the governance sector and making it to the Hall of Fame is the board chair of the United Bank for Africa, UBA. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kweku Awochi. Let's now go to the automobile category. Ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Universal Motors and Parts Limited, Mr. Subi Akkad. For Port Operations Management, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Meridian Port Services, Mr. Mohamed Samara. We now move to transportation, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of the Driver Vehicle and Licensing Authority, Mr. Kwesi Ajiman Buzia. In architecture, ladies and gentlemen, making it into the CEO Hall of Fame is the CEO of Key Architectural Group, Mr. Hussein Fakri. In banking, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of ADB, Dr. Kofi Mensa. In the oil marketing company sector, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Goil, the Honorable Kwame Ose Rempe. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move to banking and a former CEO of Stambik Bank who is now gracefully serving his constituents with love. Ladies and gentlemen, Alhassan Andani. Na Andani. In the construction sector, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Special Investment Group, Dr. Ernest Ofori Sapon. Right. Let's go to Outstanding Public Leadership Award. Ladies and gentlemen, it goes to the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, the Reverend Amishadai Ousu Sa. In moving on, ladies and gentlemen, the Women Leadership Excellence Award in the Business Leadership category goes to the CEO of Vodafone Ghana, Madame Patricia Obonai. The last award for 
The Women Leadership Excellence Award in the Business Leadership category also goes to a former CEO of Zoom Lion, who is now the Chief Operating Officer of the Environmental and Sanitation Group of the Jospon Group of Companies. Please make welcome Madame Florence Labby. And so, ladies and gentlemen, behold our heroes. Your Excellency, if it pleases you, may I invite all the award recipients for a group photograph with you here, after which we shall take leave, we shall take leave of us and we shall continue with our deliberations. I shall now invite all our award recipients to be And this is how we celebrate the indomitable human spirit of resilience as we build for ourselves and posterity a digital economy on the back of a very devastating pandemic. We say may God bless you all, may God bless the CEO Summit and may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. I shall now ask that we all rise for the national salute for the Vice President of the Republic after which he shall take leave of us. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the national salute. Please be... So we say, may God bless you, the Vice President of the Republic, and please convey to the President of the Republic our warmest delight and appreciation. 